This week on the new Screensavers, it's a sad farewell, but also a look back to some of the best moments from 2018. And now, not live from the Twit Eastside Studios in beautiful Petaluma, California, it's the new Screensavers. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. The new Screensavers is brought to you by Audible. Start a 30-day trial and your first audiobook is free. Visit audible.com slash twit or text twit to 500-500. Welcome to the new Screensavers episode 189. I'm sad to say there will be no 190, but we're going to go out with a bang with some of the best of 2018. This is uh, our show for December 29th, 2018. And before we go on, a really big thanks to our producers, Anthony Nielsen, uh, Jerry Wagley, uh, to our studio staff, everybody who worked so hard to put this uh, together. Uh, we thank them, Colleen, thank you, thank you, Karsten. Thank you, John, uh, Burke, uh, and thank you for watching. One of the things we covered a lot <laughs> on the new screensavers this year especially, uh, skydiving in VR, <laughs> bad idea. Flying uh, with a jet suit in real life, really a bad idea. Uh, playing with home robots, security bots, drink bots, remember that? That was fun. Discoveries from organic matter to Mars, to ancient cities found with LIDAR. We really did cover the waterfront, didn't we? In this Best of Show, we put together some of our favorite segments. So let's uh, kick it off <laughs> with some of the great guests to join us, starting with, yes, the Tiki Tron and its creators, Sam Cornelio, a.k.a. Dr. Bombay, Kiki Jewel, and Catherine Beckvar. Watch. <laughs> This is it. This is the Love Tiki it. Tron, uh, the world's only robot that serves tiki cocktails. As far as we know, yes. <laughs> as far as we know, ever. And you came in second this time. We actually came in third. Third. We usually dance between first, second, and third, depending on who's competing. This is not your first rodeo, so no. to speak. You had uh, the Cosmobot. Our first robot was called the Cosmobot. It, was it made, let me guess, Cosmos. Yes. yes, it was a rocket ship shaped robot oh. that launches cosmic cocktails out oh, of the fun. rocket nozzle. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, in fact, that's it right there. And oh, we, there we, we saw go. Catherine with her uh, T bot. T yes. engine. T engine. Yes. Yes. Oh, I get it. It's like the inference engine. It's, yes, uh, it's a very yes. steampunk. Very, very, very steampunk, steampunk feeling T engine. So cool. Yeah. yeah. And you, Catherine, you said it was a little difficult for the younger folks to figure out what that dial was for? Yeah, so my rule of thumb is that basically anybody who looks younger than me, I sort of coach them in the operation of the rotary dial. <laughs> Have you ever this seen was once a, a phone. rotary yeah. phone? And now it is something very different. <laughs> well, it's mostly, you know, it's they, they understand they can put their finger in and that it turns, but getting it all, you know, all the way around to the silver stop and letting go is sort of a lost. Do they ever like, just think it's a button and just like push into no, the No, I mean, most, okay, it's, good. They and figure I can't that out presume too, because it's not yeah. it's not 100 of the time but it is definitely yeah. i've, yeah, I've but been where would you see one of those except for maybe never, dial in for murder or right yeah. mm -hmm. exactly so it's it is an interesting uh it, i was not expecting it when i used a rotary dial that it would be such a clear marker between age, right. different ages and different generations and catherine you're responsible for the look and feel look and feel of the tiki somewhat yeah so so i i styled myself the interaction designer for uh for the tiki the tiki tron and it you know, we very much so both both my husband and I are very much into kind of tiki culture and I tiki love bars. Tiki's. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, uh, so I I very I wanted something that was was beautiful and and fun to use and really exciting and so it it really has been a team effort. But the the exact operation of how how you select your drink was kind of my idea. So <laughs> <laughs> and the tiki hut and the. Now, you told me we have to make a, uh, Dr. Bobby, we have to make a sacrifice before we do this. Yes. yes. So part of the fun of the interaction with this device, unlike everyone else in the world who are so used to using cell phones yeah. and pushing buttons on the cell phones yeah. to get things done, you have to make a sacrifice. And that means you choose one of these idols. Oh. Like this. 
That's it. Each, each idol okay. represents a different drink. In this case, it's the Mai Tai. Oh, you put, thankfully you put labels. I thought on. that was a price sticker. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. The, the little red ink indicates the level of, of dangerousness of the drink. <laughs> Go ahead, Jason. Pick something really yeah. dangerous. Yeah. Oh, I won't what? know until so I pull it out. The scarier it is, the da more dangerous. I, I pull the dangerous ones in the treasure chest. The the okay. non-alcoholic ones are over there. I'm going to go for the tallest one. The tallest. Yeah. There you go. Six Good choice. Good reasons. choice. Okay, that one is, is the pina colada. All right. Oh, okay. Now for this uh, <laughs> for this we have to we have to bring in uh, the engineer. Yes. Kiki is here. Kiki Jewel is the uh, d designer of the hardware and the software. Mm -hmm. Here's, I'm going to get in between you and Kiki, right. and you're going to give us yeah. a little demo of what, 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 what is it? By the way, there's a lot of stuff right. behind here. What is involved? Don't look behind the green curtain. Is it a Raspberry Pi running this? It is a Raspberry Pi. There are four motor hats that are on the Raspberry Pi. Each motor hat can control four, four motors. Okay. So for the 12 pumps, the 12 ingredients, we have three of those. <laughs> Control those. <laughs> so uh, Mrs. Bombay the, is opening, is revealing the hood. Okay, so there's four motors. There's but four it, motor oh. hats, and there's 12 motors there. Each hat can control three different. Four. four. And the fourth one is to control the lighting effects. Oh, wow. And the smoke and effects. The smoke. And okay. the smoke, of course. Yeah. So what do you program this in? So it's programmed in Python okay. on a Raspberry Pi. Yep. Yep. And uh, is it all ready to? <laughs> it's all ready to go. How do we it's ready tell? Ready for my sacrifice. <laughs> how how does how, how does his uh, sacrifice work? What do we do next? Well, when the lava's <laughs> hot, which if you if you look carefully at the, it's, the volcano, it seems it's, to be steaming. Yeah, 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 I'm a little yep, scared. It's ready to go. Yep. All right. Yep. Nothing so now, feet of. first. You'll need to make a prayer and then put it into. Bow down to the tiki god. Oh, tiki god. Oh, tiki god. And then, no, right. and then, you put it in. Now, you throw it in the volcano. Oh, I throw it in. You throw it in. Oh, ah, wait a minute. Something's happening back here. Oh, my God, you killed it. <laughs> yes. All right. And everyone cool. dances. This is awesome. Dance for your drink. Dance. <laughs> Woo. Huh. Huh. So there's, and there's it's, it's actively rummers and. Yeah. Oh, it's in, making it. Look inside. No, it's making it right now. How did it know what to do? <laughs> well, the, the Tiki God knows your inner desire. Oh, really? How did so... it? <laughs> is it is it is it doing face recognition? Well, do, do you want to do you want to geek out a minute? Yeah. So do you want to go? Do you, you, you want right? to try and figure it out, or do you want to? Oh, is it yeah, a little RFID go, yeah. chip? Uh, that's right. So look at that. Right. Look at that. There's a little RFID chip in the base of it. How so, did you guys not win first place? This is so <laughs> seriously. This is awesome. So so you're actually. See, there's an RFID reader in there. Yep, yep. There's an RFID reader in the back. So once this enters in, do you want the do you want the geek tour back here? Yeah, let's come right, on, let's come on, let's go tour. back, kids. So Holy the Raspberry cow. Pi is in here. We you know we have to protect it from liquids, right? Yeah. So you got a rubber keyboard. So you've and got a, the, and It's in a Tupperware. Yeah, this is a waterproof keyboard. That's the nicest this Raspberry the four. Pi case ever. Thank you. <laughs> so this this controls all the all the pumps. Of, we have that mix. connected to the so the pumps. Okay. Um, the the DB9 connects to the butt. It end totally of the, should have won this. This is amazing. The, the only the only volcano with a, a DB9 in its oh. butt. <laughs> I, and Pull also the all the connectors. Got it. No, I got, got it. it. You got it. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all the connectors are different so that if anybody's setting it up that they won't set it up wrong. Oh, good. You can't. You want to make sure plug it in wrong. That's important. That is easy to, yep. to set up. So you won't always be around to uh, to help. Right. I mean, it's, we can have, I put the seahorse in? Sure. Wait, let's get yeah, it. Wait, let's get it. Oh, switch out. Cut fresh I need cups. to accept oh, my... First, you got to taste yours. First, you have to yes. stir this. Okay. There you go, sir. So, uh, did, there's quite an array of beverages. You very much. Good. That has to be right. connected properly, too. Otherwise, yep. you won't make the right drink. That's right. Yeah. They're all labeled in there. So, when we put okay. the, we put the tubing in, up? and there's actually, actually lights really on the back that light up. You I'm going to see which one lights up on the back. This is really amazing. Yeah, it's really good. Now, this is a seahorse, so this is a mild... I'm a believer. Uh, 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 this is a family-friendly beverage. Is that no. right? No. no. This is, this is, this is the, one of the most popular tiki drinks ever made called the Mai Tai. I love Mai Tai. Ah, Mai Invented yeah. in Oakland, California. A little California. rum, a little pineapple. All yeah, right, so now you have to bow okay. down to the great tiki god. But while I'm Hopefully. bowing, Alex, you should show what's happening behind the scenes. All right. Because yeah, we, we want to see this actually. Can you see it drop you, in? I don't know if you can see. Yeah, you can see. That stuff, you can also see the, the code shows what it's doing on the screen. Where's the, where's the RFID reader? It's right here. Oh, wow. It's tucked that's so in. cool. So it's close enough. If you oh, get within a foot of that, it can read that. 
It's not, not NFC. It's actually about it's, an inch. It's RFID. Yeah, it's about so an inch. Pretty, it's in an inch. Okay. pretty close. So uh, it, yep. is it possible to miss? You can turn very, upside down. Very rarely it has, but it's, we're pretty <laughs> spot on now. All right. Oh, great tiki guy. Oh, 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 great tiki. I beseech you. Oh, you're going to enjoy for me your drink. The drink of true. the gods, the elixir of the gods. <laughs> and I drop in the seahorse. Oh, volume. <laughs> And the song. Yeah, that song. Yes. There's the code running on the Raspberry Pi. Look at that. It, it, it identifies yeah, what it's going to go in. It's really a little nice dark rum, a Really nice glass. Wow, that's so cool. That is really amazing. <laughs> a little curacao, orange juice, simple syrup. And, and those measurements, 0.22, is that 0.22? How do you do this? Ounces. ounces. Is all, it's in ounces. It's in ounces. Oh, oh, never I can't do that. It's yeah. very calibrated. Right. I really so wanted to the write, recipes write that Dr. Out. Bombay has given me are very So, Dr. Accurate. Bombay, you have crafted these recipes from an old family tradition. Yes. Uh, Did it put ice in there, too? No, no, it doesn't put the ice in. We the put ice, the ice it in comes with ice. Okay. Yes. Well, it yeah. comes with we the ice. And there you go, sir. <laughs> Thank you. A and proper a lovely, tiki cocktail. by the way, a really beautiful uh, yeah. tiki. And look, it's mind. frosty. Yeah. These are nice. It's perfect. It's the perfect Mai Tai. How did you research this? <laughs> yeah. Well, well many iterations. Over many long <laughs> nights. Absolutely correct. Um, we had to figure out how to convert the standard pour that a bartender does, right. yeah. like number of seconds of pour, and converting it into milliseconds of timing of the valve mm -hmm. with the peristaltic yeah. pumps. Holy uh, cow. Wait a minute. Did you say peristaltic pumps? Yes. <gasps> Flip that lid. <laughs> They're right there. So the, mo the hats, the motor hats on the Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. Control these peristaltic pumps. Yes. Yep. A per wow. Now I only know peristalsis from biology. Mm -hmm. It's so, your intestinal squeezing. <laughs> it's the same concept. Yes. So the idea is that inside those pumps, the there's three wheels that squeeze the tube right. and sucks the liquids through. So the liquids never come in contact with anything except the tube itself. Oh, very interesting. So it's so kept they're clean. flexible it's tubes. Kept flexible tubes. Mm -hmm. So oh. it's constantly running to bring the liquid across, and there's no contamination. Come on, Jerry, I know you want to taste one of these. Should we get Jerry to throw in a? Sure. Might as well. Pick your uh, pick ready to go. We happen to have another yep. one. Uh, let's try this one here. So, um, yeah, so yeah. these are the non-alcoholic ones, oh, no. and these are the alcoholic <laughs> ones. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a menu if you want to look at the menu, and then the Oh, so this is our special drink. Oh, yeah, Trader Vic's Grog. Oh. Trader Vic Grog is my second like favorite drink. Oh. Oh. That's my favorite. It requires a secret ingredient, which I'll oh. add later. Okay. Oh, yeah. Actually, I have oh, a wait, question. Wait, 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 oh, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry, no. Your question? No, 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 continue. Okay, I don't want to interrupt pray. Oh, Tiki oh, Truck. Oh, Tiki Truck. Oh, it's true. Oh, you are amazing. Legend. You make wonderful drinks. A legend in San Francisco. In. He was a one-legged one -legged bartender. Yeah. Ah! Whoa. We have a different scream for every drink. Oh, every drink has a different scream. <laughs> yes. Are those That's screams smart. Dr. Bombay's voice? Uh, we have a crew of people that helped out. <laughs> Look at that. Okay, lots of volunteers. Look at that. <laughs> So you're using the Adafruit for the the hats, the Adafruit DC and Stepper motor hats. Yep. Those are that's the ones right. you prefer. Yep. Yes. Adafruit does some great stuff. Almost yeah. everything's Adafruit. Where did you get the peristaltic uh, pumps? Also Adafruit, from Adafruit. Also? Adafruit mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Yep. Dang. Yep. Now, are any of the drinks uh, outside of like standard bar drinks? Like you de you design the drinks themselves? Yeah. The the kid drinks. Um, all those kid drinks except for the what the non-alcoholic scorpion that you provided us were all designed by my daughter and her friends. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I, have a, I have a mode, actually, where they can test new drinks where they can say a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and it'll so squirt a So does this live ounce. in your house oh, okay. uh, when it, it's not it on does. the road traveling? It does, and there are no health benefits to <laughs> <laughs> rum How old is cocktail. your daughter? She's 12. What's her name? Charlotte. Charlotte? Charlotte. These are Charlotte-designed uh, soft oh, cheers. drinks. Cheers. Charlotte and friends. <laughs> mm. That actually is a fabulous Mai Tai. Mm -hmm. uh, can can we all make one of these in our own home? Do you have the recipe for the Well, the, the code engineering is online. And so and the code so is up on GitHub. You can create your own nice. variation of a, of yeah. a drink Which machine. Which GitHub channel are you on? Uh, Kiki Org. K-I-K-I-O-R-G. -I -I Org. On GitHub, GitHub. is where my okay. code is. Okay. So you can read the code. And then, actually, you probably can deduce from that what you need. But mm -hmm. uh, do you, you have a list there as well? For, yeah. Yeah, you can modify it's it. It's a Raspberry Pi 3. Mm -hmm. Does it matter? You probably could use an older yeah, Raspberry you could use Pi. It, it's yeah. not a lot of code, not a lot yeah. of... Yeah, it's written for a three. Yeah, okay. it's written for a three. 12 peristaltic pumps. You need the motor hats. And, mm -hmm. of course, 
Did you, Catherine, did you build this yourself? So your... we, uh, my, my dear friend Megan Lush, who's an artist here in Petaluma, actually sculpted the, the tiki uh, volcano you know, body. Petaluma is the place to go for stuff like <laughs> yeah. that. I'm kidding, it's true. <laughs> I don't know why. Yep. Yeah, but we uh, we fabricated the the tiki hut. Um, works. You know, added a lot of the the details, and it's it's really what I love about this project is that it's very collaborative. It's a team it effort. It is it's neat. There's a bunch of people. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So it's nice because yeah. some people, you know, everybody brings something different to the party, and they really can. We we benefit from the skill set of of a larger group of collaborators. What a great project. <laughs> Russ Pitts is on the horn. Hello, Russ. Hello, oh. Leo. Hello, Hello. Russ. <laughs> Megan. Hi. Oh, it's great to see you. It's good to see you. Russ, uh, you, you wrote a book which is available. I can't even say the name on TV, but it's, <laughs> a, it's available on Amazon. Eagle Spit, we'll say. The, sure. Yeah. It's your sto <laughs> the story of Russ working at the early, early days of tech TV, mm -hmm. and that's available on Amazon. Uh, and it's based on a memo that you wrote, uh, <laughs> which became infamous, infamous at Tech TV, and we all loved. It was, yeah, it was on another uh, a website. We can't say the name of eftcompany.com. Oh, yeah. back oh did, did it make it to big, Pud's Eft Company? Was, oh, nice. That was the Buzzfeed of the original dot com. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. Pud once told yeah. me. His whole goal in life was to write sites that he didn't have to do any work for. Mm -hmm. So he'd always create sites that just generated content all by themselves. Smart <laughs> man, smart cookie. You have a site now called TakeThis.org. Tell us what Take This does. Take This is a, a, a nonprofit in the video game space uh, primarily. It's a mental health advocacy and awareness nonprofit. Uh, my co-founders and I, we, we lost some friends uh, several years back to depression. We realized there was, there was not a, a big push to get people talking about mental health issues. Uh, people in video game studios as well, they crunch. Uh, they, they work really hard. They uh, don't feel comfortable talking about their, their issues. They don't feel comfortable getting help. And then, you know, our, our, our good friend, Dr. Mark Klein, was a mental health clinician, and he'd tell us that the number one way to get people to help is to, is to let them feel comfortable talking about what they're experiencing. And so we found that people would not talk about what they're going through. They wouldn't get help. Yeah. And then sometimes, you know, they have a tragic outcome. So we started to take this to, to get people to uh, talk about uh, you know, we talk about what we go through. We go to, we give panels. We we publish stories at TakeThis.org of what people experience when they deal with mental health issues. We actually work with video game studios to help make their workplaces uh, more mentally healthy. We're at a lot of them major uh, conventions in the geek and game space, uh, providing a, uh, spaces where people can come if they're experiencing, uh, you know, anxiety attacks or panic attacks. They can come, they can talk to somebody. Do you call uh, those AFK out. rooms, away from keyboard rooms? I think that's yeah, we such call a those the idea. AFK rooms. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's the most boring room at any convention. <laughs> Intentionally, uh, on, on purpose. Yeah, exactly. We have we have coloring books, but mostly Aww. you know it's just chairs and tables. People come, some people charge their phones. Uh, and then we have our trained volunteers. We call them psychomancers, uh, who are there, who know how to work, you know, talk someone through uh, a panic attack, uh, know when to uh, call for help if, uh, you know, if someone needs a little bit more help than that. And so you have uh, worked with the gaming community, which is a tight community, and now working on having them speak more, people that game speak more to each other about their feelings. What about game developers? Are there specific problems that game developers? Yeah, are they using? worse than normals? <laughs> You know, we found that when we started putting together research to do uh, lectures and talks, we found that the, the common statistic about mental health issues is that roughly one in four people in America deal with mental wow. health issues. Wow. Uh, yeah, right? That's 25%. That's, that's a lot, right? And it's so uh, stigmatized, though, you wouldn't know that, right? Because everybody hides it. Everybody that's the hides problem. It. we got to talk about it. Yeah. We found that game in the game development community, anecdotally, we don't have a lot of evidence on this because people don't talk about it, people don't report it, but anecdotally, we, we think that the number is closer to one and two wow. uh, for people in the video game development Is company. that because the job's so stressful? Partly. Uh, they, you know, they tend to work long hours. They tend to uh, work at a computer, uh, not get up. A lot of folks will work straight through lunch, and they think they're you know doing a better job by uh, sort of running themselves into the ground. And you're expected to, too. I mean... That's the culture, right? Yeah, there's a lot of sort of machismo around that. You know, if I can work longer than the guy next to me, right, then I'm a better coder or whatever. Yeah. 
Uh, they change jobs a lot. There's a lot of layoffs. People move across the country. There's a lot of stressors, timelines. There's deadlines. Uh, a lot of times milestones change depending on what's going on in the industry elsewhere or with the publisher. Uh, so it can be a really stressful job. And we found that people don't, you know, they work in these environments where they don't feel comfortable taking a day off even uh, because they feel stressed or they might not even know what they're going through. So that's what we do. We'll come in and we'll uh, give lectures and seminars at, at these studios just to give people an overview of mental health wellness and then if we need to drill down uh, more specifically with specific teams we can do that too so tell us about the game because that's i'm excited about that we brought it gave us an excuse to break out the super nintendo <laughs> <laughs> yeah well this game i guess it was just delayed for 20 years uh, yeah. <laughs> well there was a lot of stress in its making let's put it that way right this is what happens when developers take time off kids Get back to work. That's right. It took a lot of time off. <laughs> now, our good friends at Mega Cat and uh, Devolver Digital uh, put together this game, Fort Parker's Crunch Out, uh, and you get to play uh, Devolver Digital's uh, CFO, Fort Parker, and you get to crunch the. That's the guy the with, a, out with a mustache. Yeah, with the so mustache. he's the he's the boss. So you get to be That's a bad right. guy. So this person is sleeping. I can go get uh, coffee for them, maybe. Um, let's hope they're sleeping. Their eyes are crossed out. I don't know if that uh -oh, they're, they're dead. Oh, maybe they're dead. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> Do you have any deaths in this? I hope I, I You know, I, I don't know. Trigger warning. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna electric shock. I'm gonna go for the big guys. Here's the battery okay. I can yeah. choose. There's an electric shock? Yeah. Will that wake them up? Uh, I hope so. Okay, I've got a battery. Oh my God, look at this. This I've is a... cruel. Oh, it didn't wake her up. Maybe the other side? Oh, maybe. Or let's try this guy. Oh, they're, oh, they're all falling asleep. Yeah. Look, you've got other ones. Oh, ah, the pig oh, hit me. Oh, no, you're never going to make this game. <laughs> so I got, wait, the, what is, why did the pig just kill me? Oh, oh yeah. there you go. Oh, there I go. Oh, he's back there to work. You, you need and more battery juice that, huh? for her, though. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I probably do. Or I can get, it. There, there's a stick available, too. You can, can beat get. them? Yeah. Man, I like this game. Um, See, I'm Fork Parker. You are. Do you want to play? <laughs> really? Okay, I got the stick. I'm going to hit this lady yeah. with a stick. Have you ever asked me for a day off, Megan? What did I do? <laughs> no. I hit you with a stick. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, when, I first, when I first played this game, it did remind me of working with Leo. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Leo does resemble Fork Parker. <laughs> so every tool doesn't work on people. I mean, this is a good, this is good management skills here. Sometimes they like coffee. Sometimes they like a stick in the head. Oh, oh. Well, you've got all but two programmers working now. And I can pick up all this money, too, that's it, laying all over the floor. It's slipping. Your, your ship date is slipping. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, I got the coffee. So what, do we, what, what is the point of this? Do we learn <laughs> how not to be? We... <laughs> I think I think the goal is to to poke some fun at a serious oh. issue in the game space. Crunch is a big deal, and it runs people into the ground. You know, I uh, several years this this information is several years out of date. But last time I wrote an article about uh, employment in the video game space, the average time in the industry was five years. Right? Really? Wow. Yeah. So that uh, the average video game employer would spend wow. five years in the industry before bouncing out uh due to stress or layoffs or whatever. It's and I don't work. think that's changed significantly since no. then. Think about so that hope, next you know, time you play No Man's people. Sky, you know, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's that's, uh, that's, you're, you're working, uh, you're paid in blood, sweat, and tears here. This is, yeah. Mm -hmm. So every time something horrible happens in the news where someone takes their own life, we always hear people saying, like, reach out, you know, people love you, we love you. But then other people say, like, it's really hard when you're depressed yeah. to reach out. So yeah. um, just saying reach out, just do it is hard. So what, what do you suggest that people, if you're, uh, if you ha like, if you, you want to reach out to someone, what are some ways, you know, besides just saying like, hey, you know, are you depressed? Like, what, what are some ways to reach out to people? Is that what you do? Say, are you depressed? Yeah, uh, you know, keep track of your friends. Uh, I, I think you, you tend to know who in your friends group struggles with uh, with feeling good or, or maybe, you know, maybe they've been open about their mental health issues in the past. People tend to get down uh, when things happen, right? So if there's something in the news that's a, a big struggle, like when isn't there now? Yeah, good uh, luck. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, keep keep tabs on your friends and check out. If you haven't heard from somebody in a few days, 
uh, feel free, you know, reach out, ding them on Twitter or whatever, you know, however you keep in touch with people. Uh, send them, so you know, send them a copy of uh, Fort Parker's Crunch Out if you want. Uh, we actually have things at, at Take This that we sell through our, our, our partners, uh, Wormwood Gaming. I call them uh, little hope shields, and I don't actually have one on me. But it, it, we basically sell those at conventions where we're at, and something you could buy, and it's, and it's pocket-sized. You can hand it to somebody as a reminder that you care about them. And a lot of people, and that could be anything. It could be a, a coin. It could be like a rock you found on the beach. If there's somebody you know who struggles, oh, they're there, right there. Um, and they make, you know, they make different types of uh, wood. Those are collectible, and they're a lot of fun. They're like little worry stones. Oh, I want so, one of those. That's and cool. And it's something you can yeah. hand to someone and say, "Hey, I, I, I love I you. I know you it's sometimes gonna, struggle. Yeah, yeah, I love you. Hold we care this when yeah. you're feeling down, and, and re remember how much we want you uh, with us." I, right? I do also want to say, though. Uh, when somebody does commit suicide, everybody around them feels like they failed. And uh, so I don't want to put pressure, I don't want it to be the impression that it's your job. You know, you should reach out, obviously, but it, but if you lose somebody, it doesn't mean you failed, does it? No, no, absolutely. You know, you can't control what other people do and you can't take right. responsibility for right. what someone else chooses to do. Um, it's good to reach out to people. It's good to let them know that you're there. Uh, but ultimately, you know, you can't feel responsibility for what someone chooses to do right. uh, because, the, you know, the, there's more more than whether or not they heard from you going on there, right? Uh, these issues are so complicated. And I think a lot of the reason people don't feel comfortable talking about them is there, there is that sort of sense of guilt and that sense That's of right. ick, ickiness. That it's really hard to, to connect with somebody because you're afraid you don't know what to do. You know, we tell people the number one thing you can do to someone is, just, is simply listen. Uh, yeah. Tell them you're there. Tell them you care about them and listen to what they have to say. And that is such a powerful act. It's so often that when people uh, you know, say they're listening to you, but they're just simply waiting for their turn to talk, right? Uh, if you, you, reach you know out to me someone, so well, Russ. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, think, yeah, I, think so, I think that's important to here. say <laughs> that it isn't your responsibility to keep your friend uh, safe and alive. But it's all of our responsibility to create environments where it's safe to say, I'm not feeling good, where we express at all times to everybody our support and love. Those environments will help more than anything else. That let's, let's change how we think about things. Uh, and I think you're doing, Take This is doing a great job. And that's really why you have rooms like that and the badges. No one person is responsible for their other people in their lives, but we all are responsible for making it a safer space and a healthier space for everybody. Jillian Ogle, she's the founder and CEO of Let's Robot, a platform where anyone can take control of other people's home-brewed robots over the internet. Jillian said it's okay for me to refer to this as kind of like Twitch for robots. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, good to see okay. you. Welcome. Good. good to see you. So if you go right now to Let'sRobot.tv, we're on the front page. And you could actually control some of these devices rolling yes, around here, right? Actually, let me put a robot on the front page. Put a robot on the front page. They're, they're more than one, though. <laughs> oh, you, could yeah. you could also go to Jillian's account. Yeah, how many are running around here right now? Oh, we've got three on right got now. Got three out there, and then you've got this one yeah, that's that, streaming as well. Yeah, that one's sitting on the desk. So um. you're not, that, what's interesting to me is that this, this is not your background. You're not a roboticist. Yeah. You're oh, yeah, yeah. an artist. Right? Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. You're busy. Let, oh, I'll let you sorry. type. I was adding... She's slacking. Adding the... Oh, yeah. I'm slacking off. That's what I do. <laughs> so that's the view from one of the robots. This is uh, this is Let's Robot TV right now. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And somebody... Now, how do you control it? Uh, yeah. So uh, if you just go to Let's Robot TV, uh, you can sign up for an account. You can control any of the robots that any of anyone adds online. Um, there's multiple robots. Anyone can add a robot. We have open source software that runs on a Raspberry Pi. We have an API. Oh, neat. Um, we have uh, kits that we're working on getting out to people. Uh -huh. um, so people could download the, the kit or the, the instructions yeah. to Well, you'd, buy, like you'd also have to buy some hardware, right? right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but Obviously. basically yeah. the idea is to be compatible with just about any robot. Mm -hmm. So we're just trying to figure out ways to interface with as many pieces <laughs> of hardware as possible and to let people control them in real time. Yeah. So who built these? Did you build these? Yeah, I built these. Yeah. But your background is as an artist. Yeah, so I, yeah, I was a professional artist for about 10 years. I worked for Disney Interactive. Oh, and, neat. Uh, oh, cool. Doing games? Yeah, doing games. Oh, cool. Yeah, and... Uh, so you can, you can draw a perfect bell? <laughs> 
I can draw a pretty good bell. Um, my my drawing skills have probably gotten a little rusty. It's been a while. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. And w how did you get into robots? Uh, so after I was doing art, I actually hopped over to game design while I was still at Disney. And then, um, and then when I left, I went to go do indie games for a while. And I finished a project, launched it on iPad, and then it was like, okay, time for my next prototype. So I spun up a few projects, and this was one of them. And I was like, you know, I... You like I, this one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because I was... Um, I was just getting into live streaming, and like all my indie game friends were live streaming, right. and uh, and right. then Twitch Plays Pokemon came out, and I was like, mm -hmm. "Oh, this is really interesting." Except it sucks um, <laughs> because you know there's like all this latency. It was a car wreck. Let's oh yeah, face it. it was a total car wreck. That was wreck. part of the fun of watching people <laughs> yeah. trying to do something. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, so you have all this latency. Um, you have chat is the only interface, so you have right. like all this spam in the chat. Um, so. You know, I was like, it would be a lot more interesting if you sort of designed around this use case and right. figured out, like, how to, right. you know, how do you handle multiple people trying to do a thing? What can you do with that sort of tool, like, if it's real time and interactive? Um, and I thought, well, robots would sort of be the end game here. So, yeah, I started working on this platform. How do you handle multiple people throwing uh, commands and instructions mm -hmm. and, and stuff at a single object? like? It, is it just in, a, in any given second the number of le you know, turn lefts versus the number of turn rights that the highest number wins and mm -hmm. that command is sent at that moment? How does that work? So the robot does what the consensus is at any given time. So it's called a real time dynamic voting system. Okay. Um, and like I, you know, you should call that an RTDV. An RTDV. Yeah. Um, the other name is like the, the mass user interface or the MUI. Um, like so the more times I hit left, yeah. the more my, more votes I get, or do I only get one vote? Uh, you only get one vote at any time. So okay. you can use the arrow keys to drive some. Some commands aren't tied to votes, so they're just sort of free to use. Some commands you have to pay for, and you know it's all very prototypey and early stage. But um, people seem to be pretty interested in this so far. Yeah, it's really yeah. to work really well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that is, but that was one of the problems with Pokemon uh, was that uh, it was chaotic. Yeah. So. So you've worked on ways to make it a little bit more like something's really going on. Yeah, and uh, like we're we're actually getting close to do doing a big update, and that'll help kind of smooth out the controls as well, nice, right? Because nice. right now it's pretty rudimentary. There's just like you know single buttons, but we'll add like you know vectors or like analog stick style controls. Oh, fun! And that'll make it a little bit more smooth. So there's really yeah. two ways to play. You could build your own robot and put mm -hmm. it online, or you can be a yeah. consumer, a robot consumer. <laughs> yes, yeah, or yeah, or you can play control. Um, the robots can hear if you type in the chat. A lot of them talk. So is that what's going yes, on with do. that yeah. noise? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's that's them chatting, chatting away. So you know they hang out with me all day at work and go with me to places and. Can you yeah. silence them when you need to? Oh, yeah. You need to focus. All right. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> Plus they have off switches. So, well, that's true. You know when. When things get really dire, yeah, there's always that. So one thing that I've noticed, it, it, speaking of speaking of speaking, mm -hmm. uh, is in chat. Not everything that hits chat is spoken through the speaker. Sometimes mm -hmm. a comment will go by, and I, I notice it doesn't go through. But then another two or three comments will go by, mm -hmm. and they will actually pass through. Is there a different command, or is it just reciting anything that's being put into chat? Oh, um, so if you put a period in front of the sentence right now, it'll stop. Uh, it won't say it out loud. That's right? what I was missing. And, okay. and then, uh, like, uh, because this room is shared between all the robots that I own. Um, <laughs> like, oh, wait uh, a minute. This one room controls all of these? Yeah. Yeah. Ah. yeah. So, like, you'll see the robot name next to the person's name, uh -huh. and then yeah. that'll, they'll be, you know, because they're talking on that robot. But this oh, is, but this is sense. like Jill's chat room, right? So it's a little, it's a little bit of a different structure because I own multiple robots, but they're all the same, you know. Owner. So if I, and I am, I'm going to follow you. If I wanted to do that, I'd go to uh, letsrobot.tv slash robocaster mm -hmm. slash Jill. Yeah. And, I, and you keep this on all the time? You, this is like always going? Yeah, and I, I try to stream as much <laughs> as like I can. You're like JR in... Uh, in uh, uh, the guy, it was the guy in Blade Runner who had the, all the little, he'd come home and go, hello, J.I., hello, J. You're like oh, that, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Like, well, you know, we're, we're slowly working towards Pee-wee's big playhouse. Right. Whatever. Good, good. Right. Every, you know, Some of these have headlamps, which is cool, <laughs> so they can, 
They can look around in the dark. Oh, yes. Yeah, they can make little faces with the LED panels and like, you know. Oh, I, that's neat. And the robots can be anything, right? So these right. are simple wheeled robots, but people have made like. Somebody's uh, doing the hand right oh, now. Oh, yeah. So yeah. there's a little Hi. hand that's this, waving. This one sits Hi. on my desk. So yeah. somebody's controlling that. Yeah. Yeah, so, and like if you see here, like you can, the, the parts for this robot are actually exposed. So, you know, there's like an Arduino here and that's controlling the motors. And then the Raspberry Pi handles a lot of the streaming. Um, the, How much uh, to build a robot roughly, one of your, one of your kits? Um, a lot of the users can uh, get get a kit for around two to 250. Okay. Um, some of the ones that we sell, cause they're, they, you know, they're more- I kinda complete. wanna do this. Yeah. yeah. Like have one in my house. Oh yeah. That would be a lot of fun. So a lot of uh, really check popular with, one Lisa. Lisa is the... may not like it. <laughs> she will step on it. And the cats will go crazy. Yes, yeah. they will. Do you have cats? Uh, I do not have cats. Okay. We, we do have a little dog in the house, though, and they, they do the have a lot of fun. The, the dog keeps its distance. <laughs> um, some people, you know, their pets are less, uh, or they're a little bit more brave, yeah. J.F. Sebastian, that's who yeah. had the little robots. So know. you relatively knew yourself to robotics in general. Did you mm -hmm. pursue the idea of the site and the kind of interface prior to learning about how to build robots? It liked it, and did that make it any easier to learn? Because when I think about building a robot, I feel like that's a, that's a big hill to climb. Yeah, so, so sort of the progression that it went was uh, I wanted to make an internet controlled robot and I was like, and I was already streaming to Twitch. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll build one and stream it to Twitch. It took me about a month to figure out how to make a, a wireless robot um, mm -hmm. that could stream to uh, Twitch. Um, and then, you know, Twitch has all its latency. I actually, right. in my first version, I actually like ran the video through a game engine and added all these 3D <laughs> graphics and stuff. Oh, wow. Um, but now we're just trying to run like straight off a of Raspberry Pi and we're really focused on like the low latency and sure. the interactive aspect. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, because it's real time control. So you mm -hmm. don't, if there's any delay in this, you're going to hit a button and it's going to take a while for it to happen. So this mm -hmm. is less late and you're trying to get this almost in real time yeah 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 and yeah and i, I did the the twitch channel for a while and then one of my friends suggested that i join like a startup incubator and try to turn oh, this neat. into a thing so that's yeah so i'm yeah doing the whole startup that was, that was good time. advice um, <laughs> it could have been premature advice it's too it's too hey, hard to say the best way to do something like this is just jump in <laughs> should jump in with all wheels. Well, you don't, yeah. do you charge <laughs> for this? Uh, well, no, you can stream a robot for free. Um, you know, that's one thing you yeah, can solve and uh, right some there. people do actually charge for certain things. Uh, okay. For instance, like you can see here, like there's cop lights that you could do on the LEDs and I have that set to one robot and a robot is something ah. you can buy to spend on things. So I do much that like Twitch, yeah. you could have donations. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so we had a user who uh, like had a, built a, like a, high velocity air powered ping pong cannon and she had it on in her workshop while she was working yeah. and then you know people would pay money and pelt her with ping pongs while she was like trying to get stuff done that's you know? that would be the solution for you and <laughs> stacy higginbotham that wants to be able yeah to, she wants to, to punch so you one of our co-hosts is in austin and she wants to be able to punch me every once in a while so maybe get the ping pong thing. have her shoot ping pong yeah that's that's close second you had yeah. one like that though right you had yeah. a, you asked people on twitch to slap you yeah yeah so one of the first robots i made was was a ro I called it the bit slapper um, because the the you use bits on Twitch, right? So yeah. people would donate bits, and then the hand would slap me in the face uh, as soon as they donated. And then, like the first day I turned that thing on, I made like three hundred dollars. So Dang! Like, well, there's there's kind of something to this. I yeah. think you also learned something about humanity, <laughs> right? That. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> We also had some fun around the Bay Area. Jason took a trip down, remember, to Mountain View to meet up with Skydio's CEO, Adam Bry. He tro tried out their, their drone that flies and shoots 4K video, but you don't pilot it. It's doing it all on its own with AI and computer vision. Watch this. I have an R1 uh, with us here today. This has been designed for full autonomy from the ground up, so it has 13 cameras on it. It has two facing in every direction. So you can see the pair on the top, each of the sides. There's also two on bottom. Um, and then this is the user video camera out front. So, you know, we have a bunch of sensing in every direction, and then we have a super powerful computer in here as well. This is the NVIDIA TX1 computer. Um, but the real magic is, of course, in the software. We call it the Skydio Autonomy Engine. 
Um, and it's really this incredibly sophisticated system that processes information from all the cameras. It understands the environment around it, so it knows the 3D structure, it knows semantic information, so it knows people, cars, sky, stuff like that. Um, and then it uses all that information to make intelligent decisions. So it's a very sophisticated device, but the goal for it, like the end product experience, is super simple. It's basically like a film crew that fits into your backpack. So um, one big difference here, uh, I think with a lot of other drone manufacturers, drone products, is that you're not shipping this with a controller. You pulled out your smartphone. Tell us a little bit about the, the, the uh, kind of the idea to do that. You've got a lot of confidence that this thing can do what it does with just a smartphone. Yeah, exactly. So it's the kind of thing that would only make sense if you can trust the drone to fly Absolutely. itself. Absolutely. Um, and one of our big design goals here is to make it so that if you're comfortable using the camera app on your phone, you should be able to comfortably use this to capture amazing footage. So you can take off from your hand um, and it's smart enough to know if it's safe to take off. So for yeah. example, if I point it over at you here, it'll say Hi. obstruction ahead, so it won't <laughs> let me do it. Um, Good, thank you. Thank yeah, you. and to Appreciate test this that. out, uh, we have Nicole who leads our flight testing uh, team. Hi, Nicole. So she is used to pushing the vehicle to the limits. Yeah. So I just swipe up to take off. Starts to spin. Yo! Now, what is it programmed to do at this very moment? Is this programmed to kind of step out and point yeah. towards us and, and yeah, kind so of lock it, onto us? Exactly. So it took off from her hand, so it knows to start tracking her. Um, so that little orbit symbol there tells us that it's locked onto her. And right now it's in follow mode, which is the default mode. Um, so if she runs around, you can see it starts to track her. Oh, that is neat. That is really cool. And it's tracking through the trees. It's avoiding all of these obstacles automatically, even though yep, that she's exactly. running through them. So if you watch her run around, like it knows where it's safe to fly. It'll weave around the trees. It ducks under everything. Uh, Obviously really great for, for sports skateboarding. Yeah. yeah, I mean, really any kind of outdoor activity becomes a lot of fun with a drone involved. So like hiking, biking, skiing, um, but even stuff just like playing with your kids in your backyard is pretty cool. Yeah. How long can uh, can the R1 stay in the air before having to come down and, I guess, I'm imagining swap out the battery or, or charge it? So the flight time is about 16 minutes. It depends a little bit on what you're doing. Um, there are a couple of other modes we can show you. So okay. some yeah. of these are new we're launching today, but I'll first show you lead mode. Um, so in lead mode, it predicts where Nicole is going and it tries to stay in front of her. So, so here we're in lead. So see, she's oh, going yeah. in that direction. And that corrects almost immediately. It like sends the sends yeah. the command, the drone gets in place. And yeah, look at that. It's staying right in front of her. When she turns, obviously it has to do a bigger correction to get back out in front. That is amazing. Yeah, exactly. That is really cool. Here, I'm gonna stop following now. I'll show you some of the one shots, which are new things we've created. Um, so we'll tap on... You can on. see the targeting. That's yes, really cool. So we can see the targeting. Yeah. Um, so if I tap on you now, it's following you. Oh, dear. And then we're going to do a droney here. So a droney's a pretty fun perspective setting shot. So I'll just tap droney. We get the countdown. Yep. Three, two, one. Ah, yeah, there you go. That is so neat. And so it does the out, and then it comes back. Exactly. Back in. Now... I'm obviously seeing from my vantage point, you know, it's it's adjusting. It's a little bit of a breeze here, yep. but uh, everything inside of the camera is counterbalancing for that. So you end up with pretty still shots as a result, right? Yeah, exactly. There's there's actually two levels of stabilization, and one of these is new with this software update. So the gimbal is mechanically stabilized. So if you look at the camera out front, it keeps itself level. Yep. But then we also do software stabilization, which is new. Um, so let's do another droney here. All right. So we'll do drone again, and I can actually control the settings. Let's say I want to go really far away, um, and I want it to go even faster. Really far away in this case is 262 feet. Wow, and then it kicks in, and there it goes, and hopefully it sees those trees, which it's going to because of all the onboard cameras. Yeah, exactly. So that's one of the keys here. Like These one-shots become uh, much more useful if with collision avoidance because you can just do it with complete reckless abandon right uh and trust it to avoid obstacles and do whatever it needs to do to make the shot work so this is obviously the kind of thing that you then do, put out on instagram or something like yeah, that so everybody yeah. can marvel at exactly so, <laughs> what you can do yeah it's it's super fun it basically creates these just like perfect instagrammable shots so the other thing that's pretty cool is that these will actually keep following you uh if you move during the one shot I'm gonna do a rocket. So when you lock to a person, even though it's doing its own pattern, it's still tracking that particular person. So if they move, it continues that pattern, but scales it 
differently depending on where they are. Exactly. So you'll see it'll shoot up in the air here, but it'll keep looking at her. So here we see it tracking oh, yeah. her. And then when it's done with the rocket, it'll come back down to wherever she is. That is amazing. That is super impressive. And then the other thing we can do, which is new, is called cable cam. So here I can set two positions. Um, so I'll say that's a position and then fly over here. Do like a manual control to reposition it somewhere. And say that's the B position. Um, oh, it's like a tracking shot. Exactly. And so I click go and it'll smoothly go back and forth between those two shots. Um, which can make, you can set up, like even with this like really simple primitive, you can get these like amazingly smooth, yeah. cool like landscape kind of stuff. And then if we want, we can set it to follow subject. If I tap on Nicole, so if she moves now, it'll follow her, but it'll stay on that line that I've given it. Wow. And so this becomes really useful. Like if you're filming a soccer game or something, you can set this up on a sideline and it basically gets this sort of perfect yeah. sideline tracking shot. That is really impressive. Yeah, I mean, this is the kind of thing where like, you know, to create something like this previously, you'd be talking about a film crew with yep. like a dolly and a bunch of equipment, and this is literally like three taps on an app. The idea, I mean, obviously we have technology that allows us to do this now. You're demonstrating that. Would you say that creators are like your number one kind of target for this technology? It's creators, filmmakers, that sort of thing? I think that's definitely a major category for us. Like, we think of this as really a new kind of camera. Like, yeah. it's a camera that you don't have to point and control yourself. It's a camera that controls itself. And we think, you know, athletes, people who do interesting, cool stuff outside, that's a major use case and, and customer group for us. And then also creative people who have this idea of this kind of shot and want to be able to create content. Um, but being able to do that without having to hire and run a whole crew uh, is, is super, super powerful. We're running a bit low on battery here, so I'll stop tracking her and then I can click return to phone now here. It's using my phone's GPS signal to come back into the general area. So GPS oh. isn't accurate enough to do super tight following, but it is enough to get it to, to just re return to the general vicinity. When the R1 knows that it's about to run out of battery and you as the operator don't do anything specifically, uh -huh. does it automatically come over and land uh, before it knows it's about to run out entirely? Yeah, so it, um, we have a couple layers of intelligence built in, so it sure. detects when the battery is running low, it'll let you know that on the phone, um, and then if the battery gets too low, it'll land itself, and it has an intelligent landing mode where it'll look for a flat place mm -hmm. to, that it thinks it's safe to, to touch down. Welcome to the inside of my smart home. This is the Schlage Smart Lock which happens to be the only device I have that works with HomeKit. So I could lock it like this, boring, or I could do this, hey, lock the door. I'm on it, your front door is locked. Or I could use the Home app on my watch. Pretty cool. Now we have these two cute little neighbors here, the Neato Smart Vacuum and the Yunmai Smart Scale. They're friends. <laughs> Ask Neato to stop cleaning. Okay, stop cleaning. Uh, did I show you this camera that was recording you on the outside? This is the Yi camera and it will follow, if it sees motion, it will follow you around, see? It's like one of those paintings where the eyes follow you around, except the eyes are really following you around and sending the video up into the cloud. This is one of the many brains of my smart home, the Echo Show, one of my favorite devices because it has a screen and I can use it to make video calls with anyone I want or to drop in on Jerry's office in Twit to find out what Jerry and Anthony are doing, which is always interesting. Here's our Sony TV, which is an Android TV that we have hooked up to an Apple TV, which can be confusing. <laughs> Works with the Android TV, so I could say, <laughs> turn on the TV. Sorry, something went wrong. So uh, here's the Apple TV if I wanted to use that. 
turn on the TV, please? I love my Apple TV because I can... Sorry, something went wrong. <laughs> okay, we heard you the first time. Thank you. I can't use voice with the Android TV, but I can with the Apple TV, so I could say, open YouTube and watch the new screensavers. Sorry, what device? There we go, and I can see our friend Flo on the new screensavers. <laughs> Stop. Sorry, what device? If you ever feel like throwing your smart devices just out the window, just know I too have been there. There's nothing a little plug, unplug and plug back in will it solve. You're always still in control. Ah, the HomePod. I really looked forward to this device, but the truth is she just sort of sits over here gathering dust. That was frightening. And I bet you're wondering how secure it is to have this device that unlocks my door right next to an open window. Well, let me show you. Say I was a criminal outside the window. Hey, <laughs> unlock the front door. I can't unlock secure accessories here. See, Apple's thought of everything. Uh, this is the Echo Plus. And the Plus means that it has a smart hub inside. Ideally, if you get this, you could just say, <laughs> find my smart devices. I couldn't find any new smart home devices. So yeah, that's, um, that's it. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go now. See you later. <laughs> hey, <laughs> lock the door. If you're looking to catch a glimpse of the future, then you'd be hard pressed to find an event that showcases a taste of what the future might look like better than the World's Fair Nano, which actually took place in San Francisco this last weekend. What's it like being a drone? We began our journey exploring some of the more modern methods of transportation. LeafTech, for example, offers a skateboard with a unique wheel array underneath the deck that helps the board ride like a snowboard. Imagine we're going down a cat track. All right. Pull up to the lift and you just do your little slide stop like you're about to get on a lift, okay? But I've got no slide because I'm not on snow. You're thinking about this. You gotta, you gotta see the snow. That's why I make you close your eyes. Yeah. On the other hand, the folks at Geoblade offered a high-tech hoverboard that, well, let's just say it rides quite a bit differently than what I was used to. It was pretty hard for me to adjust to. Vibrate, is it working? Don't bend your knees. Okay, your that's knees. different. Because when I go snowboarding, I bend my knees. Yeah, yeah this is the only board ah, you can so bend your knees. Right? Got it. The beauty is that once you've got it, you're both hands free. It makes it look easy. I give up. Now, we've all been to the airport and, you know, needed to go from one side to the other. And let's face it, all that walking can get a bit tiring after a while. Well, the team at Motobag actually have carry-on luggage that magically transforms itself into a vehicle when needed. So you lock it in place, pull these out, you turn it on, and off I go. Two speed settings, Love five it. miles an hour and eight miles an hour. <gasps> you can go a range of 10 miles on a single battery charge. Hey, it works. Not, not that bad. That's all fine and good, but let's go from the now and step into the true future. We might be the same height, but you're just a little bit more enhanced on the feet region. What's going on down there? Cheating a little bit. We have the Bionic boots here. Not necessarily a consumer product at the moment, but this amazing exoskeleton developed by Kihei Seymour allows for superhuman running speeds. It's a pair of shoes that makes a human run at 25 miles an hour. Our use of passive energy springs. I'm looking towards future advancements with servos and actuators to boost the performance to 45 miles an hour. The World's Fair Nano also offered a glimpse into the ways technology plays with the mind. Virtual reality continues to trend upwards and the Hologate team Team has been rolling out its turnkey multiplayer VR setup in recreation centers across the country. Well, the idea is it's a social experiment. You know, we want to have people actually be together and work together as a team. We have haptic feedback lights. We have uh, screens that are not just first person. They're actually third person cameras that are, you know, different around. Uh, I mean, everybody wants to play this. As evidenced by the line to view the technology, which sprawled out to a two-hour wait for the entirety of the day. Should go together, work as a team. 
Ever played a game with your mind? If the puzzle box is any indication, mind control could become quite a big deal as the technology develops. In this case, a player's focus is measured within the mechanics of the game, and that focus will actually fire off the propellers of the encased flying machine. You're going to raise this red bar up until it hits the target. Once it does, that will trigger the helicopter to take off and fly, just like that. And as long as you stay focused, what? stay in the air, and if you get distracted, <laughs> it's gonna land. Replicating that, however, was an even bigger challenge. I see it getting so close, and you're nodding. You're like, yeah, you almost, oh, no, no. Cinema snow globe, shake it, and it plays a video inside. You may think I'm talking to you right now, but I'm watching a movie. The World's Fair Nano featured a lot of tech, but it also featured a glimpse at how the future might taste. Do I want to try some algae-based nutritional bar? I think you should. However, it's going to be a journey. It's like an intense experience. Some people cannot finish it. Some people like, I love it. Okay. That's very interesting. <laughs> does, it, does it taste healthy? Yeah, it absolutely does. Of course it does. It, it, it doesn't taste artificial. I mean, I never have considered what algae tastes like, but I suppose it tastes like this. You're actually correct. We're kind of like like complemented the flavor with something to be more palatable but still you get that taste of ocean it's definitely a new experience that you never had before and you get the benefit of green teeth which is not a bad thing huh? and tongue, that's well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it I don't understand soil and it doesn't taste bad it's just it's very bland oh, okay now I get it I've been trying to interview them, and they just won't talk to me. How do we inspire the next generation of future thinkers? Smart Girls was showcasing its platform for teaching young girls how to build their own understanding of the fundamentals of coding. It uses what we're calling sugar-coded. It's a block system. It's very, very simple. You have commands over here that you can drag and drop and adjust. Uh, I'm going to show you something else, which I think is really cool. When you look at these blocks, and then you look at the code behind it, you see the same numbers. You see words instead of uh, the blocks themselves, and you realize it's not that big of a leap from doing this to real coding. All centered around these small motorized toys that can perform a number of maneuvers based entirely upon the coding prowess of the user. Your coding is obviously top notch because she didn't go off the table. She did fall once, which also proves she's very durable because she's back up there doing it again. Why are there diodes in this banana? Um, and then we saw the team at WebGuys showing off how they're enabling young students to become adept in the ways of building things like virtual reality environments, as well as, well, inserting strange probes into bananas for dramatic and educational effect. You tap a banana, you're making some music. Mycroft AI was there with its own smart home assistant platform, totally open source because, well, why should all of the tech giants have all the fun, especially when these home assistants are being scrutinized for how secure and how private they may or may not be. We don't collect any information off the voice interactions. Um, we do have an opt-in uh, for people who trust us. They want to uh, contribute their data to our data sets uh, to help improve the experience and then customizable. I mean, you see here we can do, uh, you know, some different colors. You can change the name and the wake word. You can change the voice. All our hardware is open hardware, hackable hardware. So take the schematics, adjust them a little bit, put it on the head of your robot, take the guts out and put them in a different device. It looks like Amy is free at 5 p.m. today. Some of the stuff that really sings to me personally is what we're seeing in the way of audio technology and how that merges with experiential control systems and visual representations, which is what Love Tech had on tap. They had this really cool booth that allowed you to talk to a person on the other side of the booth through a microphone with all of these really crazy audio effects and play around on an X, Y axis, really cool stuff. But they also had this cool oscilloscope setup. There's a whole variety of sounds. And what you're seeing is actually what the sound looks like. The uh, left channel goes up and down with the electron gun, and the right channel goes left and right. And it's showing it really quickly, but that's exactly what the sound looks like. You're seeing a spaceship here. I imagine you, you created the sound from the picture in that case, right? Well, it goes in both directions. 
So um, there's a really wonderful uh, piece of software. Um, Jared Bean Fenderson is like one of the pioneers of this whole art form. And the software lets you import three-dimensional models and, and see what they, uh, hear what they sound like. And also go in the opposite direction where you uh, synthesize new sounds and see what they look like. Right. So you, from that uh, dual perspective, you can generate sounds that you know, look this amazing. Overall, it was an absolute blast wandering the pier, examining, enjoying, and in some cases consuming what may have one day been thought of as the future. What's more exciting is that the future, as evidenced by what I saw with my own eyes last weekend, is now. You know, for years, hope you're enjoying, by the way, this best of episode. I am. It's really fun to see these uh, segments. We did some great stuff, didn't we? Uh, for years, we've been hearing about the magic leap, right? Billions of dollars raised. Nobody it was top secret. Nobody could talk about it. This year, they came out with an actual product, the Magic Leap One. We are dying to get our hands on one. Fortunately, Zio Design founder Nicole Lazaro, a game designer, knew all about it, and she brought one for me to try on. Watch. We're going to play a game. This is a Halloween game, appropriately, that you designed in a weekend. Right, yeah, I developed in a weekend. Now, I'm going to uh, walk around a little bit, and you can tell me what I'm seeing. So one of the things that's amazing on this is, because the computer is on my belt, I completely move around. Is this what they call six degrees of freedom? How many degrees of freedom? It's six degrees of freedom, yeah. Three, so, three degrees is like you're rotating like a record or a ballerina. Yeah. And six degrees is where you can actually... Um, up and down? Well, you can, yeah. Basically, it's, yeah, left, right, and up and down is three, but being able to walk forward into a scene... The Z axis. And then the be Z able axis. to go up and, you know, up and down, right? So you can, like, look under the table if you wanted to. There's no pumpkins there, but there's a pumpkin right there. Now, okay. this is called Pumpkin Bash. <laughs> Punk, pumpkin Smash. Yes. Smash. <laughs> so it was a game jam. Just uh, yeah. So uh -huh. by looking at these, you can see they're disappearing. Now I can see. Oh look, there's a whole there's a penta pentagram with pumpkins in them. Oh, should my. I? Is that is that should I do something with that? I'm scared. This yeah, is spooky. You, there you never know. It's hard to describe this. I know you're seeing the video, and you. By the way, we can see the field of view right now because of just the way the lighting is. There's kind of a box. Uh -huh. yep. But normally, the field of view is kind of disappears. <laughs> right. It depends on, it's all on the way, it's a new way of thinking about design. Uh, I've been working on our, our other game, which is Follow the White Rabbit for VR. Yeah. And uh, what you want to do, this one I did for AR first. So this is admittedly a simple game, because you wrote it in a weekend. I just want to <laughs> emphasize that. And the reason yeah. that's interesting is that you were able to. Uh, you wrote it in a weekend using Unity, right? Correct, yeah, Unity and C-sharp. And then um, I would got the uh, forest assets and the ghosts uh, and the pumpkins from the Unity asset store. So I didn't need to, you know. You didn't design them. I didn't need, need to, to partner with a, uh, an artist. To Let me see how many pumpkins I have now. Oh, there's one. Hey, get out of here. Go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Do you want to try the other one? Yeah, let's, let's try another one. So now I'm in a, it looks like a Parisian cafe. There's the doors. There's the manifestos on the wall. There's a top hat. Oh, there's the Eiffel Tower being built. Okay, well, that puts us in time. What? Uh-oh. There's some you do? broken tea set on the ground that disappeared when I looked at it. Carrots. What is going on in here? And there's a painting on the wall. It's kind of... Oh, wait a minute. That's not a painting at all. It's a puzzle, and I'm putting it together here. Oh, look at that. All I have to do is find the pieces... Okay, I'm going to confess to you. I've played this once before. So. Where were they? Oh, drink me. No, I don't want to drink that. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's for after the show. <laughs> That's later on. I think that goes there. The idea of this is a puzzle, right? Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. So this is an escape room. Uh, the game is called Follow the White Rabbit, and it's oh. a series of escape rooms around the world. Um, it's a game about a magician who's been a charlatan, like, all his life. Oh, so you might play this in different rooms all over the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. This is fun. Yeah. So this is another game. This is a game you wrote for VR. Right, right. And I've just done my first port to, uh, to Magic Leap. And now what you can see is that by the room, it's uh, a fully occluded room, which works okay on Magic Leap. But really, the value of AR is going to be when, you, when I drop the walls out and then right. put these. These are just objects mm -hmm. in my room. Right. as opposed to this room that you built. 
Right. So that would that's what you do in VR. You build wanna, an entire space, but in but in AR, you're not going to do that, right? Yeah, you want to basically want to you know pull the walls out and then uh, dynamically place the uh, the furniture and the puzzles and all that you right. know, in the in the room that you're actually in. Right. But what this what's interesting about both of these is that these are uh, these are it's not hard to write experiences in the Magic Leap. And what I really like is that you don't feel disoriented. You don't, you're still in your space. If somebody came in, you could have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, some might say, well, that means it's not as immersive. And well, certainly just imagine like having two people, two magic leaps, and then we're both solving this puzzle room together. together. Yeah. That would be um, amazing. One of the problems, of course, with uh, virtual reality is the inability to interact with the environment. And you see here, it's not exactly... I have to look at something, mm -hmm. it grabs it, and then it puts it up on this puzzle piece. Right. This works, but yeah. the... The, one of the big differences is I, have, I can't walk around. You in can't walk around. Space, and then, you know, this is like, you know, with Follow the White Rabbit, this is just the first port, so I'm not, uh, I haven't written code to um, place things, you know, on the different surfaces. Right. But many of the other experiences, and this is the real advantage for what uh, uh, augmented reality is uh, and spatial computing, is you really want to have the things like really the virtual object and the real objects, you know, sitting in that same world. So we would dynamically place the puzzle pieces on your, you know, on your real uh, thing, yeah, and then you know you want to be able to duck behind, you know, your, you know, your uh, duck behind the wall or duck behind a couch. Or so have I, could, I could look behind this and not have seen it until I look exactly, behind it. Exactly, exactly. And yeah. that couch is real. Yeah. It's my couch yeah, in my yeah, living yeah. room. Well, then we but just there's put, something then we behind put a, it. We put a puzzle piece like underneath on this the bottom table. surface on the table. So you're so mixing. So you have to look at the bottom yeah. of the table and then you can pull it out, right? And that ex that's yeah. why Microsoft calls this mixed reality. It's mixed it's reality. Real yeah. reality. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's this. why and that's why Magic Leap calls it spatial computing. Where do we stand right now with this Magic Leap? What do you feel like? Is this like Atari VCS days? Is I mean, where? How close are we to something really? I've been I've been in the VR space um, pretty much, you know, with especially with White Rabbit for like the past three years. You yeah. know, I've ported it onto every headset that's right. come out, right? right? Just to see like that's what's a going great on. experience. Take the yeah. same game and yeah. put it on different platforms. Right. Yeah. And so uh, you know, we were really early, obviously, on this one. This is a definitely a very different, uh, very different experience. Uh, and if you think about what AR is and you know full-on VR headset, it's just a matter of how much of the world you see. Yes. You're fully occluded in VR headsets. This yes. you're sort of blended. And I don't like that. I, yeah. And I'm really engaging yeah. with this. Although it makes a lot of people more comfortable to not much more comfortable. You know, to but not it be also feels blocked. more ghostly. It doesn't feel quite as solid as VR. Right. One of the challenges is that it is. Uh, I think as a designer, on the design side and art side, it's really about, um, it's, added, it's additive light. A lot of developers are finding that, like, um, what a workshop has done, Dr. Gordbort's Invaders. Right. And what they did is they had the, uh, the robots come in through portals uh, that, you know, dynamically place on the wall and on the yeah. ceiling. And what they did is they made the portals kind of very steampunky. And because they have these really nice, you know, specular highlights on the, on the, on the welding and on the bolts that are in on that, you actually believe there's black there. Yeah. And the seam, it's really seamless, and it really sells it wonderfully. So a lot so of that's one of the problems is you can't make black. You can't make black. Because that's see-through. Because it's see-through, <laughs> right? Yeah. But if you look at it, and it's like, you but I see, people. but yeah, yeah, it's like because your eyes, like, you know, I was talking with, uh, with, with, I think it was George, um, um, about who's the, who's the, the project lead, that you know, basically your eye goes to the brightest bit, and so you know, it doesn't it just, see the. It's just not looking at yeah. those seams, so it just believes that it's, you know, yeah. that it's, uh, that it's there. So people are going to learn this new vocabulary. This is kind of like Oculus was in the very first Oculus Rift, which I did buy in the Kickstarter and all there that stuff. There you go. But it's very early days. Yeah. And that, and, but I think it's interesting. It sounds like you think this is going to happen pretty quick. It's going to happen. I think that the quality of the, um, the apps that got released at LeapCon this, this week um, are definitely up there. They're still, you know, in a, they're still in a somewhat demo phase. Right. It didn't um, take long for VR mm -hmm. to go from 2500 bucks to 1500 bucks, and now with the new Oculus... Three hundred dollars. The price point has to go down, obviously, before it's mass market. It's got to do the same thing for that. Yeah. yeah, and then the other thing it has to do is the um, the content has got to be really broad, and I think that's something that Magic Leap has done really well. That the catalog yeah. the, is that they've got something for it's a chicken very and egg. casual. You've, you've got to get this yeah. out. Yeah. Get developers and creators to mm -hmm. play with it. Well, but it's also there's also conscious curation, and I think Magic Leap has done a really good job right. of. You know, you know, you you have Tonandi, which is a very experiential, you know, right. beautiful piece. Um, and then you've got, you know, uh, you've got uh, an action thing. You've got a creativity yeah. thing. You're hitting on all of the different types of the way that human beings play. Yeah. 
Because what Magic Loop does now to creators will tell, yeah. will inform what creators end up doing. Yeah, yeah, and I've worked, yeah. I mean, if you think of every transition of, of computers, yeah. uh, you know, every 10 years they do, and then so like with the CD-ROM, there was always, there was always a, um, there's always a breakout hit. Like right. CD-ROM, it was missed. Right. With uh, low-cost colored PCs, it was The Sims. Right. With downloadable content, it was Diner Dash. <laughs> uh, you know, mobile phones, it was Angry Birds. Right. Right. Uh, and uh, you know, and AR, it's you know, Pokemon Go. And all of those are very different. They're very different, they're and very they're different. all casual mass and market. They're all casual mass right? market games. Yeah, not necessarily. And then obviously, there's hardcore games along the line too. So that's what we're waiting for for this. So the that's breakout you know, hit. The breakout. What is the breakout hit? You yeah. know, and oftentimes it's a casual. So that's why with Follow the White Rabbit, we're you know, it's escape rooms. It's very, very interesting. You know, it's very. I love the escape friendly. room idea. That's yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're having a lot of a lot of fun. A lot of really good. Um, yeah, a lot of good reactions to it too. <laughs> And uh, we didn't even go into, I think we should just briefly, like uh, the apps we showed are first ports, so it didn't even take into account. Uh, there are, I think, uh, eight hand gestures this recognizes. We didn't even do those. Didn't even do those. It yeah. also tracks your eyes. So oh. when I, I do a motion, uh, I like... So there's a camera inside pointing at there's you. There's cameras, there's eye tracking. Oh. And so uh, back you know, back a couple years ago, I actually worked with um, uh, iFluence and helped them design an, a, a hands-free productivity yeah. app, which is just yeah. using your eyes. So you could, you know, you could word process. I could kill those pumpkins just by looking just at them. Just at looking at them. And then just take that a step forward, you could actually then do uh, facial action coding. You know, Paul right. Ekman's facial... I'm smiling, I'm crying, I'm... Well, and the, yeah, well, there's, there are six emotions, seven emotions you can measure in the face. And those cameras are like kind of close, so I, we're really interested in you know taking that apart and seeing. There's a whole lot more to be done in this. There's a whole lot more to be Very done. Very in interesting. That. Yeah, but the big, the big, the big picture is that it does sense your sense your space. It will create a depth map, and so you want to have not just place your you, you know your Lego land. You need yeah. a big room. And you want it to you want to be able to move around in it. Yeah, right? as so, this was a perfect room for that. Yeah, yeah. And then the uh, the other game that I played at LeapCon uh, by Insomniac, it's just really cute. It's called. Um, uh, seedling, seedling, and just like little Groot up here is basically you get this, you get a field kit from a, a galaxy that's losing. This I want to play this. Tell yeah. me, tell yeah, us. Yeah, so about basically it. you get this little field kit, not yeah. unlike this famous yeah. case. Yeah. Uh, Except it's virtual. Or it's a virtual, imaginal. right? So it's just basically yeah. virtual. You open it up, and then this, you get this little seed, seedling, right? Yeah. Yeah. And a field guide. Yeah. And then you um, basically create, uh, you basically plant it, and you can plant it in the real world on your bookshelf, for example. Yeah. And then week by or day you by day. You have to take care of it. You have to take care of it. Yes, Put on the magic uh, leap. Oh, I gotta water you. Water it, and you can. You have to prune it a little bit. You have to like, you know, um, peel the blight off of it if it gets sick. And then what's really cool is that if you put it like in a bookshelf, like yeah. where you had like two two signs, it'll actually grow. You know, in response <laughs> into to the that. real world objects. Into the real world objects. Yeah, it'll it'll, it'll get you some kind of bonds. Don't move those books now yeah. though, because you're gonna really confuse <laughs> yeah. it. Right, right. Wow. And then you do so you go through a series of these little of these little um, seedlings. So I think that's amazing. So right. again, like that's. A, there's a lot of, I really love how they're, they're coming up with a light, wide yeah. variety of titles because um, yeah. it's getting through all the different types of ways that people like to play. And that's really important for a platform because you never, you know, you want the whole family to be this, not just the one hardcore gamer. And there's definitely going to be, you know, hardcore, you know, stuff on here right. as well. But you want to have those wide variety I of experiences. Think, I mean, we get the form factor right. You wear this all day long. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't stop playing Pokemon Go. There you go. If I had, oh. You'd never, I, I would never come to work. <laughs> well, work would come to you. <laughs> Every time I get the chance to step into a new world in virtual reality, it seems like it goes up another level to another level, and I just have so much fun doing it. So that's why I'm really excited to be here with Ben Freeman, CEO of Infinidec, because we're going to, I mean, take a look at this, this awesome treadmill, this like next generation treadmill behind me. It's all about enhancing the VR experience and taking it to the next level, right? It's, it's giving you the opportunity to walk and experience VR at a totally different world. So you can walk through it in any direction. You can move around and spin around and see what's going on in, That's in awesome. VR. That's so. awesome. Because it's all about this immersive quality. It's very easy with VR, what we've seen in the last couple of years, to feel like it's it's kind of there but not quite because you're still kind of fixated in one position and maybe you're controlling with your hands but that's not how we live life we live life by walking from one point to the other and having a virtual world be able to uh, resemble that set, that part of reality takes it one step further. Um, by the way, I, I have tickets to see Ready Player One. You're probably going to recognize this technology if you go to see the movie. So I'm really excited to see that, which makes me even more excited to check it out. What do I need to know before I step on? on uh, so 
you're going into a totally different world. You're going to have to effectively learn how to rewalk, okay, in virtual <laughs> reality. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. What do I need to know? All right. So, George, you all set? Yeah. Okay. So, face me. All okay. Right. So, the first time you're going to do it, I'm going to have you hold onto the railing. All right. So, you I'll just get a good balance. Okay. So, the way this is works is it's based on your center of gravity. So you have a tracker that's right on the, your lower back, which is pretty close to your center of gravity. Yep. We're using HTC Vive trackers for all of this. Got it. So right now your feet trackers are really just there to show your robotic feet so you can see your, your body in, in VR. We'll, we'll use okay. those later when we get the headset on. So now just you know, relax, hold on to the railing. When he mm -hmm. starts, the system is going to center you. And then after it does that, you can start walking. Okay. When you start walking, I'll give you a tip. How do you normally walk? You don't walk looking down. You look straight sure. ahead. Sure. So walk looking straight ahead with your hands out to the sides. It'll help keep your balance. Okay. If you put them out in front, you'll start to lean a little bit. Yeah. And yeah. that's not natural. Right. So just try to keep them out to your side a little bit and you okay. should be good. All right. All right. You ready? I think so. Here you go. Yeah. Okay, okay so you just got centered and just okay. go ahead and, and walk. I'm not, I'm not even going to look down. If I walk faster, it's going to move faster in any direction? If you walk faster, it'll move faster. Okay. Oh, I want to slow down, turn around. Wow, and I mean, there's there's a little bit of adjustment for sure. Like, if, I mean, obviously the, the, the floor is moving underneath me, so I'm trying to like... It's that mental com uh, comfort with the system. Yeah, right, right. But I mean, ultimately, it's keeping me where it needs to keep me. Like one thing I wondered is if I move too fast, would I move off the treadmill in any way? But, I mean, that's part of where this comes in handy, right? And, and with this demonstration, we do have it, uh, the speed turned down a little bit so you can just walk at a certain pace. Got if it. it's at full speed, you can actually run about eight miles an hour on this. Wow, and how, how much time would it take, I'm imagining it's in milliseconds, for the system to detect my intention to run versus walk? Um, it, it's pretty instantaneous. It's, it's, again, it's based on your center of gravity. If you hang onto the rail, look down at your feet. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. And I, I did notice, I mean, even when I wasn't hanging onto the rail, if I, for a split second, decided I was going to start shifting my view downward, totally throws me off. Yeah. But that's not an issue when you're actually in the VR experience. No. It's actually harder to walk without it. Right. Um, because you're thinking about it. Like walking on the diagonal, everyone thinks is really weird. It's actually harder to walk on the diagonal and you focus more on yep. it when you're walking on the diagonal without the headset on. Got it. When you're in VR, you don't notice it at all. That's cool. All right, I think, uh, I think you I feel ready? slightly com more comfortable now. Yep. I, I think I can do this. So we're gonna drop this into your pocket here. All right, that's okay. like a battery pack. It's a battery pack for your headset. Okay. Slide it on your face first and there you go. Oh. Adjust that so it's in ah. a good position. All right, I'm seeing a grassy plain. And I actually, I have a visual representation of both my hands and my arms in here, but I also have the controllers themselves. <laughs> it's, I, I will also say that there aren't many VR experiences where I've looked down and saw my feet um, moving. The Just way like that I, the ring, having, awesome. being able to see your body <laughs> helps you feel comfortable and not lose your balance and things like that. I just want to kick something, but I won't because I've got expensive technology connected to my all right. feet. All right. You all set? I think so. Okay, so same thing. You're holding off to the side. Okay. On, onto the ring a little bit. Yep. It's going to center you, and then you can start walking once you feel comfortable. So I'd say hold onto uh, the ring yeah. a little bit. <laughs> just, to, just to start off with. Now, one, one question that I've had about this particular aspect of things, like emulating real-world walking experience is that in the real world when we walk from point A to point B it's kind of boring because it takes a long time to get from point A to point B. How in a virtual sense do we keep the fast-moving pace of video games that we expect? So what we can do is, is the way it's mapped your, your steps that you're taking in virtual reality and real reality can be mapped at different speeds. If you're a, a character that's two inches tall and you're in a big scene, your, your gait on your step is very different than the gait if you're um, Godzilla walking through Tokyo. What's the end game here? Do you want this to be something that uh, you know, anyone can purchase and have, a, have, a, have in their living room because they're just that passionate about VR? Or is this more about like experience centers, going to a recreation center, throwing a bunch of people into a VR world where they can walk freely and compete against each other, that sort of thing. Sure. Um, our, 
Our plan right away is to launch this for uh, VR gaming centers throughout the world and work with medical device companies. We believe this, there's a lot of potential for physical therapy, stroke recovery, okay. re relearning how to walk after part of your body has been paralyzed, corporate training, uh, firefighter training, um, where firefighters can have a training center with five or ten of these and sure. they can set their whole gear, uh, get on their whole gear and walk through a house as it's burning. Wow, I can't, I can't even, like I hadn't even considered the kind of the, the therapeutic aspects of this kind of technology. You could, you could give someone legs that maybe doesn't have them in, in the real sense or give, you know, give someone mobility, let's say, yeah. that might not have that type of mobility. Um, in, in the real world, uh, and it just takes that VR experience one step further. This is really cool stuff. I love Along it. with our software development, we've also got beta systems that we're going to try to ship before the end of the year. So we can get units in VR centers, medical uh, device manufacturers, work with partners to get these out to the public. When could people possibly start seeing these things in places that they go? Uh, we hope sometime next year that we'll have some of these in some VR centers. Hey, we're going to get back to uh, more of the best of 2018 with the new screensavers. But I got to tell you about my favorite sponsor. I think one of our original sponsors when we started this network, certainly a company I've been a customer of since the old screensavers. I was driving down to San Francisco from Petaluma every day, long two-hour commute each way. And I was about to go out of my tree. And then I discovered Audible. Audible. This was back in 2000. Audible saved my Life. I've listened to over 500 books on Audible. All kinds of learning, entertainment. Uh, I listen to fiction. I listen to nonfiction. Right now I'm listening to <clears throat> a really great book by one of my favorite Audible authors. I, I can't recommend it more highly. Uh, Yuval Noah Harari is his name. He's a professor in Israel of uh, history. He's written some great books. In fact, I would read all three of them, starting with Homo Sapiens and Homo Deus. But his latest is a 21st... Is it 21st Ideas for the 21st Century? Uh, it's so compelling and interesting. And I think more than that, important. That's what Audible is great for. It entertains you, but it also educates and informs you, makes you a smarter person and a better citizen. And we need better citizens in this world. What would it look like if we all listened more? Audiobooks motivate us, inspire us, bring us together. And Audible's got it all. Not only the largest selections of audiobooks on the planet, but also members get two Audible originals every month from a changing selection. You, they're originals. You can't get them anywhere else. I've had so much fun listening to the Audible originals. Uh, a one-woman off-Broadway play, Carrie Mulligan's Boys and Girls. Unbelievable. Uh, well, I can go on and on. But the best part about being an Audible member is every month you look and you say, oh, which Audible originals should I listen to? And of course... Every month, Audible members get a credit good for any audiobook, regardless of price. You also get access to so many other things. It means more than just books. I really want people to understand you get audio fitness and health workouts created exclusively for Audible. You won't get them anywhere else. If you have a, a, a month that you say, I don't, I don't need a book this month, don't fret. Unused credits roll over to the next month. And if ever you get a book you don't like, which has never happened to me, but you start listening and go, this is terrible, uh, they'll exchange it for free, no questions asked. And all the books are yours. They're in your library. So those 500 books I've listened to over the last 18 years, 18 years, wow, as an Audible subscriber, they're in my library. And I have to tell you, I go back and re-listen to some of the classics, all the Harry Potter books. I listen to all 21 Aubrey Maturin books, you know, those great seafaring novels from the Napoleonic Wars. I like that kind of stuff. I listened to them back in the 2000s as I was driving back and forth to Tech TV. And I recently started re-listening to them again. I love them so much. Uh, Shogun, when we were in Japan. I had listened to Shogun before, but I started to reread that James Clavell novel. Now, you notice I use the word read. Sometimes people yell at me and they say, you're not reading, you're listening. You hear every word. It's the full book. In fact, often it's better than the book because it comes to life in your mind. I'll give you a great example. Uh, Lincoln and the Bardo, an amazing book that is a great read, but the Audible production is 10 times better because they have different voices for all the characters and it, it's, it just comes to life. As you're driving in your car, doing the dishes, walking the dog, going to bed, having an audio book from Audible can change your life. So here's the deal. Start a 30-day trial 
Get your first audiobook free, audible.com slash twit. Or you want to do it on your phone because there's a great Audible app, iOS and Android. I love the By the way, the one of the nice things about Audible app, you listen in the car, you get out of the car, you pick right up where you are. You can listen to Audible on your Amazon Echo. I, I listen on my Sonos, and it knows where you left off. There's no bookmark necessary. It just starts where you left off. Uh, actually, they back up like a sentence, so you can kind of say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know where I am now. This is awesome. Uh, you could text the word TWIT, T-W-I-T, to 500-500, and they'll give you a link. You can download the app, get your free Audible book. I think you're going to love it. A-U-D-I-B-L-E, audible.com slash TWIT, or text TWIT to 500-500. We thank Audible for their many years of support for what we're doing here at TWIT. They're a great sponsor. I think of them as great friends and uh, a great companion. Thank you, Audible. Now. It's time to get back to the show. One of uh, the greatest friends of all time, uh, one of the original screensavers. He actually, w it was really kind of a great story. He was uh, uh, one of our IT guys, and he came to me, it's probably about in the year 99 or 2000, and said, Leo, I found uh, what I consider to be a massive security flaw in Microsoft Windows. And we said, what? We called Microsoft. They said, that's not a bug, it's a feature. Yeah, they literally said that. So I said, Kevin Rose... Come on the show. I know you've never done TV before. And uh, show us this bug. Well, as you know, the rest is history. We, we dubbed him the Black Tipper. The Dark Tipper. Not the Black Tipper. The Dark Tipper. Uh, he never liked that name, by the way. Uh, and he became our expert on all things security and hacking. And, of course, went on to a great career, not only in tech TV, but later uh, founded uh, Dig which was a great success. He was on the cover of Business Week, the $60 million man, <laughs> became a venture capitalist with Google, started many more companies, and he's really doing great work these days. We caught up with Kevin Rose earlier this year uh, and asked him a little bit about cryptocurrencies. Here you go, Kevin Rose's tutorial on keeping your crypto safe. So most people don't do what I did. But this was early on, and there was, things like Coinbase didn't exist. Yeah. I just downloaded software, created a wallet, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then gave people my number. You have a public number, which can also be a QR code, and people can donate. Right. In this case, it was donating to TWIP, or people can give you money based on that number. Um, nowadays, you, would you do it that way? Uh, in terms of like, if you wanted to get into a, a, a cryptocurrency, would you create your own wallet? Um, I would probably start by well, it depends on which currency you want to purchase. I think a lot of people say, "Well, I'm just going to Coinbase. And yeah, say, create an account there." Right? It's the easiest way to to do things for sure. Now I mean, there are people who used Mt. Gox in that's the right. past. They lost every bit of their that's Bitcoin right. because Mt. Gox disappeared. And that we've seen this happen before. So there's a certain amount of trust involved. That's right. With giving somebody. Yeah, wallet. and for me, you know, I've used uh, Coinbase a lot in the past to purchase, but then I immediately move it off site and into my own kind of cold storage using something like one of these hardware keys. Oh, interesting. Um, or, so you can do that. You don't have yeah, to leave the wallet. That's there. right. That's okay. right. So you can just transfer it out and get it out of there right away. And their limitation is that they only sell what? Bitcoin, Ethereum. Yeah, uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, and Litecoin. That's it. That's it. For now. They've announced they're going to do a bunch more, and How they'll probably support some of the tokens I, as well. I've, I've seen, there's more, there's hundreds of Yeah, these. I mean, here's crypto, uh, cryptocurrency market cap, and I mean, there's, this there's is a several great thousands. Yeah. Uh, he, he shows 1,610 how... total cryptocurrencies <laughs> that they're tracking. But this is a, a great example of a site that you can come to, and let's just say um, you've heard about something, like let's say Neil, for example. And you, or let's use Monero. This is one of the really privacy coins that are out there. And you're like, I want to own some Monero. How do I go out and buy this? Well, you can't buy it on Coinbase, right? right? Like, it's not available. So what you do is you just click on the Markets tab, and you can see where it's trading. And then what I do is I typically look for um, some of these uh, trading partners that have high volume. So see, these are some of the big ones here. You know, Binance is doing $7 million I wanted a day. to buy some Stellar Lumens. Let's, I, let's I couldn't, look at that. but I set up a... Uh, Coinbase account and then bought some Bitcoin and then sold and then went to Binance, which does sell right. Stellar. Yeah, so Lumens, here's Stellar right here. And then you buy, so it's a complicated right. process. So, so you'd have to set up a Binance account. Yeah, I have Binance um, and Coinbase. Right, so you start with Coinbase, like you said. You get and they it, you take transfer. dollars at Coinbase, so you give them dollars. Right, you can use a credit card, you can use a bank account, things like that. Or, yeah, and then you buy Bitcoin. That's right. And then you transfer it to somebody else or Binance? Yeah, so you transfer it to Binance. So if you look here, but check this out. See where it says pair? Yeah. So you can see that there's a Stellar Bitcoin pair. So you can go straight from Bitcoin directly into Stellar. Ah, 
Okay. So you wouldn't go to Coinbase and buy something like Litecoin because they're not going to be paired up. Yeah. You'd have to then go Litecoin, Bitcoin, and then Stellar. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a lot of, lot of hurdles to That's get through. Great. But then where do you hold this? So you'd have to set up a wallet locally, right? Like so what is a what is a Bitcoin wallet? It's not like a wallet where you have money. No, it's just in a it. piece of software that's running on your computer. It's software, right? So you have your private. And ultimately, keys. it's a file, right? Yeah, exactly. It's a file. It's a single file, typically a .dat file, wallet.dat, and uh, it's encrypted and stored locally on your computer. So and in you fact, there's the keys for that. There's no money in the wallet.dat file. There's merely your private key. Private key. It's a right. private key file, just like a PGP private right, key file. Exactly. Would be. And what you do uh, as when I was trying to recover my wallet is you then load that wallet.dat file in there. It has to download the entire ledger, the right. blockchain of transactions, at least for Bitcoin, which is hundreds of gigabytes. Unless it's a light wallet and it just points to the network. Some of them then, are a little better than that's this. That's right. Yeah. They've figured out this was a liability. Well, it takes forever. It can take <laughs> yeah, multiple days. days. Yeah. When I was setting then, up Monero, it was like three days. And then it has to walk through the ledger and look for your transactions and find your transactions <laughs> That's right. and at the end of another day it'll say oh yeah i found 7.57 bitcoin right now what's your password well yeah, yeah exactly you'd have yeah. to have your password first so what's a better there. way to do this so there's a few things first thing i want to recommend to everyone is that if you're serious about this stuff and you start buying it yeah. um you should get a separate email account for where you have all of your communications uh related why to is this. that well if you think about it the ways to unlock your account and to reset it are typically by email or a text message to your phone. And so if you have a Coinbase account, those emails are going to be sent to your primary email account. And a lot of people are going to know what your primary email right. is because you're using right. it to have conversations. So what I recommend doing, get a separate Gmail account. They're free. Yeah, they're free. Create something obscure so no don't one's going to guess it. Don't make it Kevin Rose at gmail.com. Right, or Leo's Crypto at Gmail. <laughs> That's even better, yeah. <laughs> And then uh, enable their in extra enhanced security. Okay. So that requires one of these guys here. These are different hardware keys. This one slides into a USB. This one is Bluetooth here. These and, these are also crypto based. These are right. your these are basically uh, key validations. I have a YubiKey and a and a Bluetooth based ones. They they require you have one Bluetooth for phones like iPhones that don't right. support uh, a USB port. Um, or NFC. Yeah, so they, they'll have, uh, Google will actually recommend you these three. These yep. are the three that I bought via yep. Google. And then you enable that on your account. Now you have to have this. If you lose it, it's going to be a lot harder to get into your account. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that will secure your email account. So that's but like, that's good. You want it to be hard. That's yeah. going to be hard for and the And you can do guy. this even if you're not in a cryptocurrency, right? Yeah, like but you it, just, yeah. If it's you're paranoid, yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, second thing is... Um, this is two-factor plus. That's this right. Is, this is even stronger than just two-factor. Right, think. which is just like a text to your phone yeah, or something For like most that. people, two-factor is sufficient. But if you're, if you're storing millions of dollars in Bitcoin, you, you want to make it right. hard to get. So the next thing is um, software-based wallets. So this is a, an example of one that I like called Jax. And the reason I like this wallet is because it supports so many different coins. Yeah, so, so my Bitcoin wallet only supports Bitcoin. That's right. So you can go in here and say wallets, oh, and then look at all these different coins that you can enable here. Okay. So you can say, uh, I have some Augur here. Some of these are actually tokens and not is real currencies. Ja is Jax Mac only or Mac Windows? Uh, I believe Windows as well. Okay. Um, so Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, Litecoin. You just enable them, and then you can switch between them at the top here. So you can say, how many ETH do I have? Obviously, this is just a, t a test account, so there's not going to be any And that in here. QR code you see there is something you can give to people? Yeah, so this is your address. Right That's here. how they send you money. Right, so you can just copy it right there. So I just copied it to the Got clipboard. It. You can see and I you can text can it to them there. and say, send me money. Right, exactly. And if you have their number, you press that send button, you can send them. You hit send, you put in their points. address right there. Yeah. Let's say that's a dummy address. You type in how many ETH. I want to send them four ETH and then hit send and it goes right over to them. Now one thing I noticed is there's a transaction cost for all of these. That's right. And it's variable. The more you pay, the faster, at least on Bitcoin, the faster the transaction happens. That's right. Um. <laughs> so, but here's the thing that's interesting about this though. Uh, when you set up this wallet for the first time, there is one um, set of different words that they give you to restore this wallet. Oh. So you have to write down those those words. You have to store them it's in something it's a like backup code. last pass, one password, things it. like that. Uh, an alternative to I that. I wished I had used that wallet. That would check this out. What's so this? So this is called Crypto Steel. <laughs> so you this put your hysterical. words. Yeah, this is not a digital wallet. No. This is you slide that's those your passphrase. Those, that's your passphrase, and you slide those in one at a time. 
and you, this is just a dummy phrase, you can't try this at home, you're not gonna get anything out of it, but you slide them in and then you keep that in a safety deposit box you or just anything you want. You seal it up, you, you can put a lock down. on there. Now, if somebody got this, that would be, this is, That's this, right. is this is something to remember with these. If somebody gets this, right. they've got your wallet, they've got your This coin. is like holding cash in your hand, It's basically. like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so someone took this and they put it in a, um, they, they created this big uh, fire pit and they put it in, and they let it sit in there for like 30 minutes, no problem. They threw it off a balcony that wow. was like 10 stories high, no problem. So that, see, it's, again, it's, it's pretty see, hardcore. If Leo had put his passphrase into this, I would be, you know, $70,000 richer right now. You gotta remember the passphrase, <laughs> it's killing me. So that's, okay, that's, so that's what's that called? Yeah, this is called Crypto Steel. Crypto and it's steel. not cheap. This is like $150 or somewhere around there. Um, you could also write it on a piece of paper and put it in a safe but, deposit box. Right. So if people that have it on a piece of paper, obviously if there's a flood, okay. there's things like that, you know, that, that okay. kind of goes away. There it is. Okay. How much How much is the price now? I think they raised the price. $199? Wow. Yeah, $199. But it is, it's kind of a neat artifact. It's pretty cool. This is the kind of thing uh, Axe would have in Billions. Exactly. You know, on Billions the other night, a guy did, a, did him a favor and he handed him a USB stick. He said, here's a stick, there's a million on it in Bitcoin. He never gave him the passphrase though. That's right. So you need the passphrase. You need the passphrase. Um, one but step you could do that, right? I could give you a USB device with a Bitcoin wallet on it. Oh, this right here. That's, this? What, that's, what, this, that's what these are right here. That's this, this is the stick? Yeah, so that's a Ledger hardware wallet and this is a, a Trezor hardware wallet. And if you take a look, I can I can show oh, you what it looks like when they light. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So, um, so this why has does soft... this have a screen? What's the screen? So for? The, the screen is for getting your pin and, and putting your pin in as well to unlock it. So all of your private keys are encrypted and stored on this device, and okay. it also has a unique phrase. So if it gets damaged or smashed, you, you can buy a new one and restore code. it with okay. that unique phrase. Okay. Um, and then you can take a look at all the different currencies that this supports. So, so the reason you would carry this around is so that I could like uh, have dinner with you and then sh give like show you my QR code. Is that on here? Well, no. Uh, actually, I think What's it does. This for so, well, it en encrypts everything on this little device, so it gets yeah. it off of your computer. So many people are worried about their computer becoming if compromised computer because they're hacked. connected to the internet. Yeah. And so this is actually, you unplug it from USB, there's no internet connectivity, Got everything it. is stored on there, you throw it in your own home personal vault or wherever you like, uh, you know, safety deposit box. And so if you look at the software right here, this is the Trezor software, it's plugged in via USB, and then here are all the different coins that it supports. Uh. So you can say, I have some Litecoin, whatever it may be, switch over here, and it's talking to the USB device. Now, now look at the, hold up the USB now device. Now I have to enter in my magic pin. Yeah, so if you look at the, the USB, so in that, that's the, uh, it randomizes the arrangement of characters. Oh, wow. So, so I know my pin. So you could figure out what the, where the fingerprint juice was. Right, so. Um, How do I enter it? Uh, so you do it on the desktop, so look at the desktop oh. now. So now I just. Now I do the arrangement. I think oh. it was this one here. Oh, so was I the get last it. One. So on the desktop, you're just getting dots. On the key, you're getting where the keys are. Exactly. And you blew it. Yeah, I did. Let yeah. me see here. You're hold on, hold on. One million dollars down the tube. What's cool about these there is you call them wallets, but there's really nothing in them except these digits, these these numbers. I guess I lost the pin. <laughs> <laughs> I was setting it up as a dummy account, but you get the idea. Yeah, there's nothing in it but um, the hard, hardware keys, and they're all encrypted on that device right, as well. Right. So the one but thing you're right. So sometimes I see people put their Bitcoin wallet or their crypto wallet on their phone. That's probably a bad idea. Yeah, I mean, your phone can get stolen, and yeah. someone, if they can unlock it, they can get access to your... That's why I use a really long, strong password known to no one, even me. <laughs> That's right. So you're safe. I'm safe. No one's ever you stealing your steal coins. steal my wallet. Because um, uh, I keep my wallet on my NAS and it syncs automatically to all my devices. That's, that would be bad if I didn't have a password. Right. Although, yeah. as you pointed out, there are brute force software that, since they have the wallet, yeah, they I wouldn't can hammer do that. on it. I, I would keep it, on, it on one of these hardware devices, yeah. get it off your computer. The one thing I will say that I like about this Ledger device, um, it's very similar to the Trezor. Um, if you take a look at the screen and we scan out here, um, these are all the different wallets it supports, and there's a, a lot of different currencies here. So it'll support Ripples, it'll support um, the, what did you want to buy earlier? You wanted to buy Stellar, Stellar right? Stellar Lumens. Yeah, Stellar's on here as well. Is it? Let's see here. Um, yep, Stellar right there, it supports Stellar. So if you start buying a few of these different currencies, the more obscure ones, you have to make sure that you buy a hardware wallet that supports it. 
is gone, so we've turned this into a cooking show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, we said tech, tech. Uh, yeah. uh, these are, uh, you, Leo and I did a tech cooking segment, but you have mostly different things, um, and you have some of the same things, but some that you use them very differently, which I, I use think these is interesting. all the time. So, I mean, this is, I, I don't, I'm, I cook a lot, but I'm not a really highly technical cook. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, I just know how to make things. And so the idea, what, what I was trying to think about are things that I use that just make it easier. Like it's not, this isn't about becoming, um, you know, the next Gordon Ramsay. This is about your meals are easy. You don't have to think about them and they're good. Yes. You know, you know that's, it kind of makes them great. So um, the one that I got in, introduced to in Japan, I, I, I worked on a movie in Japan for six weeks and so they put me in an apartment. And in the apartment they have, every apartment has, I think every household in Japan has a, a zojirishi, a zojirishi, zojirushi. Sorry, yes. I'm, not, I'm good like at looking that. at it and knowing it. <laughs> Those are Rushi. And uh, it is, um, this is a, uh, uh, it, it's a really smart rice cooker. <laughs> so if we open it up here, you'll see the rice is, the rice is done. Ooh. It sang us a little song earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what's cool about it is, is that you literally take this little cup and you fill it up and you decide I want one of these cups or two of these cups or three of these cups. And then you've got these little numbers that, are, that come up the side. And it just, that just tells you where to put the water. Uh, so you put the cup in, you fill the water to the right line, you know, for the, and it has all the different kinds of, you know, whether it's sweet or brown or jasmine or white or, uh, in this case, sushi rice. Uh, and it just, you close it, you select what kind of rice you have on the front, and then you hit start. And it just, off it goes. You know, and it, and it does, it, it, and, and, and then you walk away and you don't think about it. And literally, it'll keep the rice uh, moist and, and ready to eat all day. Um, now it's best when it just comes out. This was done a little earlier, so we'll pull some of this. I'll not put it in there. So, but what you're going to notice is for sushi rice, su sushi rice, um, you know, it's nice and moist. Mm -hmm. If we take a little butter. Oh, butter. Butter. <laughs> That's good. But if we mix that in a little bit, what we really need is some uh, chopsticks. You know, chopsticks, yeah, exactly. But you can see how it's nice and moist. It's kind of uh -huh. just the way you'd expect it. Yeah. You know, and. Um, I don't know if it's very Japanese to put butter in your. I rice, don't think but, it is, but, but that's I'm okay. doing it anyway because I'm, you know, one foot in, one foot out, right? So, so anyway, but um, here, try some. Okay. Mm. Tastes good. And you didn't have to think about it at all. No, that's what we I like. We didn't have to think about time. We didn't have to think about anything else. We filled the cup to the top. Good. We filled the water to the line. We shut it and hit start. Right, and then we did something else. And we, and we went away and just never thought about it again. And at the end, during the show, we heard the little, it sings a little song. Mm -hmm. um, so it sings a little song, tells you your, your, your rice is done. And if you're not ready right then, you just leave it there for a little while longer. I would really like things that are not, that are precise about what they do, uh -huh. so that I don't have to be precise about what I do. That's <laughs> so, so smart. You know, so, so, you know, so the other, the other one that I, um, that I use a lot is, uh, I use the Innova. Uh, and I've used, I have lots of different sous vide cookers. I got the first one that was like a box. It was like this, the Supreme, and it was like a box you put stuff in. And then I've got a couple different other versions of, of it. But I've been the happiest with the Anova, and I admit that I have a couple. <laughs> um, and uh, the the reason is is that what what, what uh, the Anova is good at, and you probably talked about it on your other segment is, or or what a, a sous vide cooker is good at is that you, it's very precise about the temperature. You don't have to be very precise about the time. So that, what that means is that we have friends coming over and I want to uh, have a steak right when they get over there or I want to be ready for that. I don't have to worry about when I start that steak. Mm -hmm. When they come over, we'll, sit, we'll say hi, we'll get, grab a beer, and I'll throw this and cook it in minutes, two or three minutes, and it's going to be great because the whole thing has been cooked. Essentially how the sous vide works is that the water is at a certain temperature, your steak is at a different temperature, as you leave the steak in, or the steak, the chicken, the vegetables, the salmon, as you leave it in there long, longer, it essentially, the, the meat equalizes temperature with the water. So end to end, it's whatever temperature you set. So in this case, I set it to 128 degrees Fahrenheit. That means the whole steak after an hour is at 128 degrees. Now, the only thing that happens when I leave it longer is that it gets softer because mm -hmm. basically the heat is denaturing the protein. And if you... Uh, <laughs> So and, and what happens is like we left it in here for an hour, so we'll try it after an hour. Um, for like a try try tip, my my wife uh, likes it at about thirty six hours. I like it at about twenty four hours. If you leave it at forty eight hours, I think it gets a little mealy because it gets soft. Mm -hmm. And I have found if you leave it for three weeks, 
turns into liquid. <laughs> Why would you leave it for three weeks? I would love to say that it was an experiment. I just wanted to see what would happen, but I I put it in and I had I had the Supreme, which is closed, doesn't make any noise. Uh-huh. I put it in and I was in a rush the next day. I went to Europe. And and, and, I, and I came back and it was still on. You didn't remember and, that you didn't eat your steak? Uh it was a lot of things going on. I was I was gonna eat it that evening and then I realized, oh I gotta leave that evening. Yeah. And and then I just didn't think about it again. And then and then um I I there's a lot of oftentimes a lot of things going on in my head. Mm-hmm. And so things get left behind. So none so, of this technology is gonna remind you to eat. No. Okay. No, it's just gonna <laughs> okay. be but when you remember, it's there waiting for yeah. you. You know, yeah. and so so the great thing is is that and and again, like if you're doing a barbecue, what's great is you might put two or three steaks in there. And so whenever you feel like having another one, you just pull it out. There's a couple different ways of heating it. Uh, you can, uh, I brought a blowtorch, we'll play with that in a second. Mm. Um, you can also throw it on a hot pan, so you can get a, like a cast iron pan and get it up to 500 degrees and throw it on there and sear it, because when it comes out, it looks a little, you'll see that it looks a little like a science experiment. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but when it, so then you just, you just gotta caramelize that, out, that outside area. Um, the best way to do it is a big green egg, or some version of that, where you're basically, get it up to 800, 900 degrees, throw it in for a minute on each side, and you're done, and it'll be the best steak you've ever had, and and you didn't have to do anything. So, the let me show you how you do it. This is the part that gets people caught up, is they buy this part, right? They, right they've yeah. seen the Anova stuff, they buy it, and then if they're smart, they'll they'll fir- the first thing that everybody does is they buy this, and then they start using it with their pots. <laughs> so, oh, I gotta, and then, then there's like a pot because they, they advertise like this is all you need, right? It's not all you need. So uh, the, the way to do this is you get this, and this is now down to seventy bucks or eighty bucks or something. It's not very expensive. When I bought it, it was more expensive, not that I'm bitter. And, um, <laughs> and so, and then I got this, this is a Rubbermaid 12 uh, quart. And if you buy this on Amazon, it'll say, hey, would you like one of these? And the answer is yes, yes you would. Um, and then. What, does it come with this little No, this isn't, this is, this is a thing? So Vita. And it, when you buy this, it will say, hey, do you want this? <laughs> and the answer, you won't say yes the first time and you wish you had. So, um, so what this does is it keeps the temperature, it'll, it'll put, you use less energy with this if you have this to insulate it a little oh. bit. And then there's a top that I forgot to bring in, which is that you put it over and it keeps it the water from evaporating. So those are the kind of full things. And then some people, if they're going to do something for a long period of time, actually have cut holes in igloos and stuck this in, you know, through the, oh. into the thing because then it really keeps the water where you want it to be. And that has nothing to do with the quality of the sous vide. It just has to do with how much energy you're using to keep it at that temperature. So, um, so you, have, you get this little kit, and this is all going to, together, all of these are going to be about... Hundred dollars, ninety-five hundred dollars. Then, I have bought very big and expensive uh, vacuum sealers, mm-hmm. um, and this one's just fine. This How much is, is not, that one? This one's like seventy bucks or fifty bucks, or it's like fifty to seventy dollars, depending on where you see it. It's made by some Japanese or some Chinese company, and the name up here changes about every six months. But it's so, the same one. but it, but if you look at this form factor, this is about this is what it what it should be. So, this is a vacuum sealer. I'm just going to open it up. And there's a couple things that catch people. The first thing is, this is a roll of vacuum seal. So basically, it's just one long roll, and the, this is the way to do this, because instead of trying to figure out which Ziploc to use or what bag, you just make it as long. If you have a tri-tip, you need this much. If you have a little steak, you need this much. So you just decide what you need. And so you just cut the length, and I've got a little steak in here that I grabbed at Rayleigh's on the way here. And um, so you take your steak, well, what you would normally do is put it on a plate, but I'm just going to stick it in here right okay. now. And then I like, I use a lot of different kind of salts. So oh. this is the salt. We, we talked about this. This is the same salt. We use this little uh, Malden sea salt. Yeah, These I are f- flakes, and the flakes tend to work really well with the steak when you're doing it. And I'm making a big mess with the salt. Sorry in advance. It's okay. Anyway, so then you, 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 get, some, you get some salt on here, and you want to get it on both sides. And this, I usually do it on a plate, but I just realized I don't really have it quite set up right, so mm. I'm just going to do it this way. I'm going to get salt all over this table and in the electronics, and John is going to hate that. Okay, what's this? This that is like... Espresso Brava salt. We're not going to use it on this one, but it is so good. So uh, you can add this to the steak, and it actually gives it a whole different kind of taste. Can you use this on other stuff? Because I don't actually eat steak, so... Um, um, you can, can you... use it on all kinds of things that you would use salt on. eat it straight? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. you can. <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> that might give you a little buzz, too. Okay. Like, yeah, and so, so anyway, so then, and then I like to add a little, you know, like a little twig of rosemary mm-hmm. um, for the, you know, to uh, set it up. So you stick it in there. Oh, you just, you don't just, even break it up. You just nope, stick it in there. Stick it in there with there. Now, this is what everyone screws up. When they buy it the first time, they put it way up here. Oh. And then they're like, it doesn't work. Every single person I've ever given one of these to, it's a lot of people, um, 
they always say it doesn't work. And so you have to get it right in, because this is the gap that's pulling the oxygen out. Uh -huh. So then you push this in, and then you hit. Whoa. Just thinking about it. And then, so what it does, it sucks all the oxygen out and then immediately seals the end. And so now you have, it's ready to go. And the reason you need to do this is because you need the water to be completely touching the surface of this object. If, if there's air in there, number one is you could have, you could, it's a great breeding ground for bad things yeah, if you're yeah. gonna leave it there for a long time. Like three weeks. Yeah, like three weeks or, or two days. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, um, and then, uh, but it also means that the water is completely touching all of this and you don't have big air gaps. And the biggest thing is, is that it floats. So if you throw it in there and you have air oxygen in it, it'll float to the top and then, mm -hmm. it, then, it, then there's this constant issue. So, so anyways, you take that and we'll take, we had one that we put in before the show. Okay. You want the plate? Yeah, sure, we'll grab one of these plates here. So this is the, sorry, I'm making a really big mess here. Um, That's okay, we don't have to clean it up. <laughs> Excellent. So then you take this guy and you just throw him in there, right? And then, uh, then we find our scissors. I have to say that doesn't look that good. It doesn't, not until you're. <laughs> oh, you don't eat steak either, so right. it's not. Right. But be I like, mean, even when I used to, no, like when, it looks when, a little. No, because um, it doesn't. It doesn't have. It hasn't been seared. So uh, you're used to seeing it seared. By the time it does this, <laughs> like usually fire has affected it, right? And uh, to someone who doesn't have steak, does it really gross you out to have steak near you? Oh uh, no, no. I just, I, used to be... I mean, even if you loved steak, like this looks know, weird, right? It looks like a little moldy. I know. It's a, it, I, as I said, I said earlier, it'll look like a science okay. experiment. So then, so then, what you <laughs> celery and carrots is just the base of a soup. All right. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, so now we, now we. This is the easiest way to do it when we don't have anything else to be really hot. Should so. we have safety goggles? I guess not. Sure. Sure, I think safety goggles would be a great idea. <laughs> if only we had some safety goggles, we'd be safe now. But instead, we're living on the edge. So now, my kids, the, the, the nice thing about doing it this way is mm -hmm. that it is a lot more fun at parties. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, my, my kids, went, if I, I did this once, I think, for one of my kids, like, where their friends came over. And they only wanted the sous vide because they wanted to. Yeah. Um, they wanted me to do this in front of their friends. Right. They wanted you to wield fire. And they wanted to do it in front of their friends, and I was like, ah, uh, <laughs> let's talk about that. It smells really good. Can you make bacon with this? Oh yeah, you can make bacon. Um, so I make I make a bacon a bacon sandwich, a egg bacon and cheese sandwich for my kids for breakfast, and I you cook the I cook um, black forest for. Um, about uh, a day in the sous vide. And then you cook it for like a minute on each side. And it is just, it's a super soft. Because remember, everything just gets softer. Um. So anyway, so there you go. So now it looks more like a steak, right? This is a concept that we have seen for over a decade. It is something that has so much promise and yet sometimes it has been a little bumpy as far as adoption and implementation is concerned. Thank you very much for coming to see us. Now, of course, you've got your gear set up here, and uh, we are speaking... This is Asher. That's he right. He co-founded Blade. Blade is doing online gaming, and I mean, you're saying you're giving the equivalent of a GTX 1080, Ooh. a Xeon or an i7 equivalent Focal processor. Focal dedicated core that you're getting, and you're getting basically equivalent to $2,000 PC that will mm -hmm. always stay. Was so that $2,000 with current 1080p value, MSRP of 1080p, or the value four weeks ago? It's the value usually <laughs> before the high rise when you can find the, where you cannot find even for $1,000 a GTX 1080. Yeah. So how much am I paying a month? So you're paying $35 per month. Okay. And you're getting a computer that you can access it from everywhere, okay. from any device, any screen. And and actually, let's make that clear because some people might think, oh, it's, it's just games on tap. This is a full Windows 10 desktop. It's exactly. I don't know if they can see the screen here, but basically here we have the shadow box. So the shadow box is optional and it can replace your desktop PC. So the goal of the shadow is that you will feel that the Windows is running here on this small box. Right. Even if this small box is taking only 15 watts of power and basically it's doing nothing than just to decode the video stream that's arriving from the cloud. So 
As you can see, we're getting a full Windows here. We have dedicated components that we're getting from the cloud. Mm -hmm. And unlike other solutions in the past, we are doing end-to-end -end solution, which means that we are building our own servers. We're putting them in our own rooms in the data mm -hmm. centers. So we can give a dedicated component to each user. So you are not sharing your graphic card with other users. You are not sharing your CPU cores with oh, other wow. users. You're getting your own and your own component, so you will always have the same level of high performance. Okay, we, we have, you got to switch this because yeah. I mean, I'm watching his movement, and it actually is. I don't see you much can lag. You play uh, yourself if you want to. Feel In fact, it, the uh, lag that I see, I could, I could probably attribute to the fact that it's going through a switcher, the TriCaster, exactly, a scaler, and, it's and then capturing back here. the screen also. Yeah, watch and me that's, run off a cliff really quickly. Yeah. Now, when I when I install this on a, on a five year old laptop, I have an Acer S7 that uh, you know it's an ultrabook. It's it had no power when it was new, and now it's yeah. very long in the tooth. I was able to run modern games. I was exactly. able to run Call play, of Duty, uh, and it you can shouldn't. play the last Far Cry Five on a five year laptop on the max setting of Far Cry, and you can run it on a 4K resolution or 144 FPS, and we are the only one in the market because we did an end-to-end -end solution. It's also, we developed all the software that's doing the capturing and coding and streaming, and we succeed to achieve to less than three milliseconds for the most complicated frame of 4K. So this is not this is not a shared server. This is not a virtual machine. This is an actual. As as actually, Father Robert ran into saying that you're actually configuring Windows 10 when you when you set up your account, and you're actually getting your own dedicated GPU. Exactly, you're getting your own fully dedicated for your GPU. You're getting your own CPU cores and your own memory, and you're getting 256 gigabyte of storage, and you're getting a full Windows 10. So you can install Steam, you can install Origin, you can install any platform and download all your games and play them directly on a full setting. Do you have to put colo centers all over the, I mean, are, is the United States, the world, what's the, where are you guys currently So selling? right now we launched in uh, West Europe uh, last year, mm -hmm. and now we're doing soft launch here in California to really familiar and getting uh, all the information about the internet infrastructure here, mm -hmm. uh, how to deal with it, how to, to learn also the market. The, the gamers sure. here are actually very different from the gamers in uh, Europe. Okay. Uh, so we, we're learning, we're interacting with our community, and the, until this summer we're going to cover all uh, US uh, nationwide. Okay. Okay, yeah. I, I, I have to ask this, uh, because I, I get the value proposition. The value proposition is, I pay $420 a year, and I get a PC that is automatically updated. So Always it's updated on your yeah, side, updated. I don't or have to worry about bucks a month. It. Or 50 bucks a month. Five dollar basically, yeah. Right. for a... Yeah, for yeah. For if you yeah. want to go month to month. Yeah. But then, and Patrick brought this up in the pre-show, I have to be concerned about what I've seen happen to other streaming services where they were all killed by lag. Yeah. Every single one of them was killed by lag because you can't do a high performance Twitch capable gaming system over just the regular latency that you're gonna get on the internet. So how do you fix that? I mean, ob obviously I can't do that with RDP, so this is an RDP, yeah. but what do you have? What's your secret sauce? So basically, like I said, because we develop end-to-end -end solution, we are also doing our own protocols for the streaming that's capable to reach much, much better results than any standard streaming so far. And actually, so far, the biggest blocker was not on the network itself, but was on the capturing and encoding and all this mm. process that's taking more time than the network. The network, you can simply overcome it by placing data centers next to the end client, okay. not far yeah. away, to have a good peering agreement with all the internet providers like Comcast, AT&T, all of those, and to have peering on the other side now. A so it seems like we are not, it. you have already thought about all of the trauma that we have run through <laughs> in all the previous gaming services. But look, for example, yeah. what's a small advantage that you give to you. I don't know what's your internet speed here. I guess it's around 200 megabit or something like that. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we've so got a decent connection. If you're going here, but actually here we are from our data center. So we use you use your computer, even if you have 15 megabit at your home, mm -hmm. you're still getting download speed of one gigabit oh, per second. Okay. You're getting super low ping time. So actually, when you're playing online game and competitive games, you're getting lower ping than your local PC because you, we have a direct you're you're basically data sitting in the colo and not dealing with all of the, exactly. the cruft at the ISP. So I can, and, and we talked about this before. This isn't just gaming. If I want to run Adobe Premiere on this, I can do it's that. If I want to run, okay, it's your Windows 10. You can install whatever you want on it. But much more than that, you can start to play. On your, in your room, in mm -hmm. your shadow box, and then you need to go to the kitchen. I can take my tablet, I can launch 
either iOS, either Android. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see the tablet here. I'm launching the Shadow app. And I can continue. I can directly continue to play on the tablet. She's getting pretty meta at this point. I don't, I don't know if you ever saw this kind <laughs> of level of graphic on what a $200 tablet. <laughs> OK, that's not bad. That's actually and we can play directly without any latency, any kind of game for PC, directly on the tablet. And much more than that, you can take your smartphone. So this is my personal iPhone. I don't know if you can see the screen of it. But we are on LTE connection. We are not on the Wi-Fi. We are directly on the LTE connection, and I can launch the Shadow application. And here we have the Shadow Beyond, which you know it's not easy to use the Windows UI directly on a on a phone screen. So it shows me all the games that I have installed on my screen, my uh, computer, and I can launch them directly. So we can do launch the Tomb Raider, and I can play directly on my iPhone without any latency, any lag on a 4G connection. Okay, that and looks really, really good. I, I'm just going to say that. And wow. you can do it any kind of, uh, in any kind of place, in the underground, in the, in the street. You can continue to play whatever you want directly. And of course, on a Mac uh, computer, which is very nice design computer. I love the design of this computer. The weight, the screen is amazing. But there's no Windows key. But exactly. <laughs> you don't have, you know, actually, you can do the command keys uh, switching to be uh, the Windows key. But you can finally play any kind of Windows game directly on the Mac screen, mm -hmm. on, on the nice Retina display. It's affecting immediately. And you can have full Windows. So you can put your Photoshop. You That's can the do part all I actually liked. Tool. I, yeah. I love the fact that I had a full Windows environment. I exactly. Because I can install anything on top of that, and it gives me a super capable machine. Hey, what's up? We are in Pleasanton, and I'm wearing something pretty fancy. I think, I think you would agree. Uh, you're probably wondering why I'm wearing <laughs> this kind of a suit. And actually, it's because we're at a place called iFly, which means that I get to live a lifelong dream of actually seeing what it's like to skydive. But this is twit, right? So there has to be a technology angle. Skydiving is great. Well, they do skydiving in combination with virtual reality to simulate the entire experience. I am so pumped and slightly terrified, uh, but we're going to jump, literally jump into it right now. The skydiving takes place inside a vertical wind tunnel that is blanketed with fans that push the air up. Wind is pushed through that tunnel at speeds that I saw starting around 120 miles per hour. <laughs> My instructor showcased his own capabilities at speeds upwards of 180 miles per hour, which is pretty crazy, but none of this happened before I was given a solid education on what to expect. What in the... Hi, I'm Chris. I'll be your guide today. This included learning a few hand signals that would help to guide me, the flyer, and keep my body in the air safely while wearing earplugs that are actually blocking the ear-piercing noise of the fans inside the tunnel. From there, I had to make sure that my suit fit me properly. Mental note, I'm insanely tall, so usually the answer is not really. And I had to get fitted with helmets and eye gear to protect me in flight. This was perhaps a bit more disconcerting when throwing the VR helmet on my head. I will admit, when I put the VR helmet on, I felt a moment of panic. The thought of being propelled into the air while wearing a gear VR helmet was kind of getting to me a little bit. But then I realized it was because the helmet was a bit too small for my head. So, you know, it just didn't fit. Oh, that's what I missed. <laughs> I just had to go like this. Once I replaced it with a larger VR helmet, I knew I'd be okay and it was time to soldier on. From there, I headed into the wind tunnel waiting area. This is where you sit or pace nervously as you await your turn inside the wind tunnel. And after a quick recap of the hand signals and a once over on my gear, I was ready to fall into the wind tunnel. prepare for the VR flight, I had to first fly a few times with all senses in check to make sure I had the basics down before being blinded to the world with a VR goggle on my face. I'd literally fall into the door, arms above my head, with my instructor guiding my body into the air. It was a total leap of faith. But suddenly, I found myself midair, wind whisking every fold in my jumpsuit, my arms held out in front of me, and in place firmly by the strong wind. The challenge was really all about being loose, but not too loose. If I tensed up, my body might not hover symmetrically, 
And the same could be said for when I let my limbs fall loose. The trick was finding that perfect balance, and obviously the hand signals really helped in finding that balance. My second flight was perhaps my best flight. I felt like I was totally on. This is where I felt truly in control of my body position in midair, and where I noticed my instructor has to do the least to keep me centered inside the wind tunnel. I did begin to tense up toward the end of that second flight and almost immediately noticed a shifting of my stability, uh, which I quickly corrected. So then, after all of this, I was ready to throw on the modified helmet with a Samsung Gear VR embedded into it. Now, thankfully, with the helmet on, I was shown the pass-through camera uh, while standing in the waiting area, so it wasn't completely shut off from the world. My instructor let me know that the experience was about to begin, and I was led over to the entrance of the tube. That's when the 360-degree immersive video began playback, and... Suddenly, there I was in the belly of a plane, surrounded by fellow divers getting ready to jump out. And on the count of three, I would lean forward through the door, hands in the air, and just trust that I'd make it into the air alive. Now, sure enough, the staff are absolute pros, and I suddenly found myself flying out of a plane, plummeting toward Dubai, United Arab Emirates. Uh, as I looked around me, I saw other skydivers making the trip with me and thought it was interesting at first. I quickly realized why the effect wasn't absolutely convincing, though. Sure, my brain felt being in midair, and my eyes saw me above a city, but I wasn't convinced in the way I expected to be. In VR, it's very hard to really lock onto the spatial cues that clue you into this kind of travel. The ground is so far away that very quickly, it really just seems like you're looking at a picture of a city from above versus actually plunging rapidly toward it. Not only that, the resolution that was achieved with the Gear VR and the resolution of the video that was being played were low enough that it really just kind of felt like, well, I'm wearing VR while skydiving more than anything else. Jumping out of the plane was perhaps the most exhilarating part because of the interactive element of pushing oneself into the unknown, timed with the visuals in VR. Hovering over the cityscape was maybe a mere taste of what it could become in due time, either with improved resolution, a more dimensional experience, or some other enhancement that we just haven't quite figured out yet. All right, I had an amazing time. It's an exhilarating experience, uh, including with VR. There's there's some potential there to kind of improve that experience and make it just a little bit more convincing. But I really liked what I saw, and I'm actually thinking I might bring my kids out and uh, show them what it's all about. I think they'd be uh, pretty excited to do it. I'm Jason Howell. See you next time. We have assembled the smartest, finest minds at Twit. Well, anyway, whoever was available on Monday to escape from the nuclear <laughs> reactor where at Reason, the escape room in San Francisco, it's a team building exercise. You ready to build a team, Megan Maroney? I am. Jason? Yeah, sure. You're ready? Colleen? Jerry? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you're taking this seriously. You brought a little GoPro with you? Let's meet the, uh, the Reason crew, all right? You built a nuclear reactor here and you're having trouble with a meltdown? Yes, we do. And we really need our hel your help, sir. What's your name? My name is Karina. Hi, Karina. Hi. And you and Mike founded Reason? Yes, yes, we did. Two years ago? Yep. What is the point of this? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a mix. So one of the things that we really want to focus on is education. Um, because nowadays, you know, there are a lot of technologies on the market. And even here in Silicon Valley, people know about virtual reality, 3D printing, drones. But you don't really have the opportunity to experiment with them. You know, you have to buy them. And they're still pretty expensive. So we wanted to build a venue where people can easily get access to them and see if they like it, see what the whole fuss is about. And and also put it in a more engaging kind of experience. I think the meltdown is happening now. <laughs> Pull the rods. Okay. So um, this we're going to be using a lot of modern technology yes. in the process. Exactly. But it's also about working together as a team. Definitely. So it's definitely a team activity, um, and uh, it's all about coordinating, coordinating and problem solving. So unless. It's less about the puzzle aspect, so you have to solve a puzzle really hard for 30 minutes, and more about working together and see how you can bring different skills to achieve the mission that you have. Okay, so we don't have to be smart. It helps, but uh, if you work really well as a team, that's going to be even better. Work as a team. Now, you, know, you guys have never done this before, <laughs> but here's our opportunity. 
What is the fastest? And we're going to do the nuclear reactor yes. room, right? There's two of them. What's the yeah. other one? The other one is crash site. It's an alien land crash site. Exactly. Oh yeah. boy. Yeah. That's for bigger groups. Yes. Okay. Definitely. And how big can a nuclear reactor be? So a nuclear reactor goes up to 15 players. Well, it's pretty big. Yeah. Two rooms. Yeah. So how big is the alien landing? That one is even bigger. That can go to 20 plus. We so can even have 25 people in there at the same time. A company might bring a, a, a group in, you know, a team that works together, bring them in to help them kind of have exactly. some fun, but yep. also to facilitate them working together in the future. Yep. Cool. Exactly. What's the fastest anybody has ever saved the nuclear reactor? The fastest is 48 minutes. 48 minutes. Today's mission is a pretty standard sci-fi scenario. Basically, we have a nuclear reactor that was sabotaged and the meltdown sequence was initiated. So your mission today is to stop the meltdown from happening. Otherwise, and listen carefully here, you're not going to make it to dinner. <laughs> Very high stakes. But we've ordered Great. sandwiches. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, so you really have to get out okay. if you want to make yeah. it to that. Yeah. <laughs> cool, so a few things to help you in your mission. As you guys know, this is a team activity. So working together is the most important thing in there. So make sure you communicate as much as possible. You divide and conquer, because you'll be able to work on multiple puzzles at the same time. You have unlimited hints, so feel free to ask for help. The team that got out in 48 minutes, did they ask for any they help? They did not have any hints. Yeah. Okay, well there's a standard we're setting here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right, but you ready no guys? Pressure. We're gonna do it, all right, everybody? All right, okay, okay, okay! I have very little confidence at this point. <laughs> oh no, get in here! <laughs> we're in here now. Let's just hit this button and see what happens. Nothing is happening. These all smell, they have different smells. If you press the button, the smell what? comes out. Seriously? Apparently I have to put this on. Oh, wow. ah, this is, this is, I can't see a thing. Press the colored button. Sure. Nothing. All right, we've used 11 minutes, kids. We gotta make some progress. Oh. What the hell happened there? What was that? Is there anything that requires like a code okay. to be entered? Okay. So, so. No one's listening. <laughs> is this a kaleidoscope? What is this? I mean, why would it be here? Why are we here? Happy going you guys. Terrible! <laughs> I think we're gonna still try and do it ourselves. What does SSMT mean to anybody? We're in deep trouble here. Oh, wait a minute. Oh! Simple match is up to here. So this one goes first. Oh! <laughs> oh, we got a long way to go, kids. <laughs> Nothing's working. Nothing's working! Come on, guys, there's an incoming video transmission. Oh, it's an HTC Vive. Oh, that's do you have a password? How do you even get to that command? We got to 3D print something? No. You're putting password. That, that was all you. I just used my fingers to enter something. Who's good at drones in here? Whoa, watch out, Jerry. We have 10 minutes and 50 seconds, boys and girls. Yeah. This is good. We're making progress. We might get out of here alive. We might. Oh, oh, yes! yes. Nice. The next one is the other one. Uh, yep. Give me the number. Done. Override terminal. Here we go. Change the second. Yellow. Blue. Okay. White. To restart Dang the answer. Here it is. It's going to blow. Game over. Game over, man. Three, two, one. Oh! We were so close. No. What did we get wrong, Karina? Oh! <laughs> it worked! Oh my god! That was awesome! Wow, I can't believe it. That's it. It's over. The end of the line. Uh, it's been a great... How many years have we done this show? Uh, let's see. I could do some math. This is uh, episode... What episode is this? Uh, 189. We do 51 shows a year. That's almost exactly three years we've been doing this show. I hope you've enjoyed these shows, and I hope uh, people uh, appreciated the tribute we paid to the original screensavers in the six years I did that on uh, Tech TV. Uh, we tried to recreate kind of the spirit and the feeling of it, and I think we did a pretty good job. Thanks to the staff who put in so much hard work, our executive producer and my wife and our CEO, Lisa Laporte, and uh, Jerry and, um, and Anthony. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this new screensavers. I'm sorry that we've had to call it a day but and as it happens to every show there's there comes a time when it's time to say goodbye thanks for being here uh, and we'll see you next year with some brand new stuff see you then <laughs>